Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Board of Commissioners of Boulder County. It's Monday, June 16th, 2014. Commissioners Gardner, Jones, and Domenico are present. And we are here for a presentation from our, uh, it's from the Commissioner's Office and our Commissioner's Deputy, Michelle Krizek, will be walking through some details for you in just a minute. Just a reminder for everybody, this is a public hearing and we will be taking testimony on the Gross Reservoir Expansion Final Environmental Impact Statement. And we're here tonight, we're here this afternoon for information only. So we won't be taking any positions. We've already um, responded to um, the FEIS with a letter, which you have hopefully a copy of. Um, <coughs> we'd like to have you give us any additional comments or strengthen any of those comments that were already in that letter as we um, respond to uh, questions about the final environmental impact study. So that's the focus of our discussion this afternoon. We're um, not going to be taking any positions on anything at the end of the process. It's primarily to get your input on this um, uh, final environmental impact statement. And before we actually get started with the presentation, we are um, sorry for the overlap with the um, USA <laughs> soccer game. We're in competition with that, just so you know. If you hear shouts from the, the mall, that's what's going on out there. The U.S. is uh, at work. Um, so And is currently leading, I might add. In yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, and if you see us distracted, it's probably because we heard something from the... Uh, the outer world about where we stand. So anyway, we'll, um, we'll move through our hearing as expeditiously as possible. And if there's anything of the match left, we might have a chance to see some of it or the recording of it. Um, before we get started, just a reminder to everybody <clears throat> about cell phones, you know, turn them to silent and um, that our strategy on timing is uh, uh, up to 10 minutes for pool time and up to three minutes for individual speakers. And we'll go through those details when we actually start the public hearing portion of our afternoon. And uh, before we do get started, one other item. I um, wanted to make sure that you know that um, Nisa Erickson, the district representative for Congressman Jared Polis's office, is um, here and will be listening. I think um, Jared would have loved to. There's Nisa right there. Um, you can touch base with her if you have any other input you'd like to give the congressman. And thanks, uh, thanks for being here tonight. We appreciate it. And with that, um, we'll go ahead and turn to Michelle Krizak our Commissioner's Deputy, for a brief presentation on our letter and the final EIS. Thanks, Commissioners. Michelle Krizak, Commissioner's staff. Um, as you said, we are here tonight to receive comments on the final EIS. I just want to make clear we did get some comments from the public. There is not an application before you at this point on this project, so we are here solely to talk about the environmental impact statement and to give additional comments to the Corps of Engineers. We did provide comments to the Corps. We submitted those before the June 9th deadline. Um, we did request an extension of time to give comments to the Corps. And while the Corps did not grant an extension, they did say that they would consider any substantive comments that came in after um, that uh, June 9th deadline. So our purpose here tonight is to hear from the public. We will set, we've got Numbers of staff here will be summarizing the comments that we get from the public and we will be submitting additional comments to the Corps based on what we hear tonight. And as you know, there's nearly 16,000 pages of documentation, so there was a lot to go through and so I'm sure we're going to hear um, tonight some, some new ideas that we didn't include in our letter. As you said, Commissioner Domenico, there are copies of the letter that we submitted out in the foyer. Um, our comments really centered on deficiencies that we saw in that final environmental impact statement. And they, they very closely mirrored the comments that we submitted in 2010 to the draft environmental impact statement. So at that point, we submitted some, a pretty um, substantive amount of comments. So we referenced those in our letter. And I think you can summarize our comments in the fact that the whole purpose under NEPA is to look for the env least environmentally damaging practical alternative. But in reviewing the um, impact statement, there weren't a lot of details to determine whether or not that's exactly what was occurring. In sum, there wasn't a ro robust um, discussion of the need and purpose for the project. Specifically, there wasn't any analysis of water conservation measures that could be taken or other um, smaller projects that could be undertaken instead of this large project. So it was hard to determine whether this was the right alternative. There was also lack of information regarding project design and implementation, making it impossible for us to evaluate the environmental impacts on Boulder County and its residents. 
for example, there wasn't information about the proposed truck traffic impacts. There was a discussion of some mitigation um, alternatives, but there wasn't robust discussion of, those, of what would happen and how many trucks and what the queuing would be like. So those are things that we felt needed to have more exploration. There also were assumptions made about the amount of material that would be produced on site versus the amount that would be trucked up. And this is important because depending on how much is produced uh, on site, there would be an environmental impact for the quarrying operation or there will be an environmental impact for the trucks coming up the canyon. So there was, wasn't enough information really to understand exactly what the impacts would be. And then I think finally, the one other large glaring area was there was not a lot of clarity about the removal of trees and what would happen to those trees. Approximately 400 acres of trees would need to be removed for the expansion. Whether those trees would be um, incinerated on site, whether they would be trucked down, all those things have very different environmental impacts. And so there wasn't enough there for us to really understand exactly what mitigation would be appropriate. Finally, the, the FEIS was, did not have um, a requirement to have um, binding mitigation. And without the details, it's, it's impossible for us to determine what that would be. We have been in discussions with Denver Water over the last number of years about this um, project about what it would, the impacts would be to Boulder County, but we need to make sure that if something goes forward, there is some requirement that there be mitigation, and the FEIS doesn't give us enough guidance in that respect. <laughs> then I think the the one other part of the FEIS that was a little difficult for staff as we were reviewing this is it referred to this project as sort of a temporary, ordinary construction project. And as you know, in Boulder County, we have done a lot of work with our comprehensive plan to ensure that our rural areas remain rural and that any heavy industrial uses are in our cities. So our zoning doesn't allow for this type of a project. It just isn't something that we are used to having. So it's not temporary nor ordinary in our estimation. So again, we really, um, feel like this is a, a very large project. Even though there are 16,000 pages of documentation, there's not a lot of detail for us to understand what mitigation would be appropriate. So that's a, a quick summary of the letter that we submitted to the Corps. And we're here to hear from the public. We will be taking notes, um, putting that all together, and submitting additional comments to the Corps. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, let me just check in to see if there are any questions from the board before we start the public hearing. No, thanks a lot, Michelle, for that summary. Yeah. Okay, great. And um, we have, I think, 13 pool time groups, just so you know. Um, those can be up to 10 minutes each, and then a number of individuals. Um, we might um, wind up doing some alternation, so individuals actually don't wind up staying all, all night. We'll just see how, the kind of, how it balances out. And um, so just a reminder to you, if you have a, one of the 10-minute pool times, we have a lighting system up here that tells you the time frame. And it's a green, yellow, red um, setup. So um, green for your first set of minutes. It starts flashing green at one minute left and amber at 30 seconds. And when it beeps, um, that's the time for you to stop. So um, thanks. And thanks for being here tonight. We're looking forward to your, your comments about the um, FEIS and looking forward to what we can add to our letter. So uh, first up, do I think is it, uh, Chris Gar is going to go first? But they have a PowerPoint presentation. Great, too. Chris, thanks. Yeah, I have PowerPoint. Oh, okay, is that, is that you that has PowerPoint? No. Oh. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Great, thanks. Chris, uh, Chris Gar, 18 Juniper Heights Road, Golden, Colorado. I'm the president of TEG, the Environmental Group. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, operates in Boulder County and um, it's been around since 1990 and we've been addressing this project since 2003 when it was first introduced to the public. Um, a year and a half ago we had a meeting here, uh, the, the county had a meeting and considered uh, an intergovernmental agreement with Denver Water and I just want to reiterate now a year and a half later um, how thankful we are that that, uh, that meeting didn't go in the direction of signing that IGA. I think that was a really crucial moment in this whole process, and um, we feel really great about the decision that was made that night. Um, additionally, um, I think it's also clear now with the final environmental impact statement released um, that what was being waited for, the decision that was made at the end of that hearing to wait for the 
FEIS to see the impacts of Boulder County to actually see what was going to be dealt with and how it could potentially be mitigated um, is still unrevealed uh, and I think that that might be a little telling of uh, maybe those decisions haven't been made yet and if the decisions haven't been made on how the project is to be done maybe the decisions on how the project should be mitigated aren't ready to be made either so unfortunately I think we're still at the same position as far as the uh, lay of the land in uh, talking mitigation or any kind, kind of um, strategy like that. Um, additionally, I would, I would uh, like to personally and on behalf of TEG thank uh, the county attorney's office for doing an excellent job and all the staff who assisted on the comment letter that was submitted um, on the final environmental impact statement. Um, that was definitely very compelling. Um, in the past, at all of these meetings in front of the county, we have um, discussed the uh, 1041 regulations uh, that the county possesses and um, many citizens have pressured for the county to exert its 1041 authority um, in opposition to this project. Today uh, we are talking exclusively about the final environmental impact statement and our additional findings on that um, supplemental to what the county found. Um, TAG managed to put together um, through a extremely large volunteer effort, a 104-page comment letter with 175 pages of studies and six DVDs of appendices. And we submitted all of that to the Army Corps in person on Monday and uh, through email as well last Monday. Um, I sent that over to the Commissioner's Office today. Obviously, it's too long to have a good read uh, in preparation for this meeting. And a lot of those points will be reiterated throughout, I'm sure, but there's plenty in there that there just simply isn't time for anybody to talk about here today. Um, but nonetheless, very good, and I hope you find it helpful. Um, some of the key pieces um, that are in that letter, but also I think uh, warrant being spoken out loud, um, we like to call them fatal flaws, meaning that they're flaws with the impact statement that um, would cause the project to not be able to be permitted. And um, the first of those uh, has to do with the purpose and need of the project. And that's a very formal terminology that uh, the Army Corps uses in the environmental impact statement to refer to a very specific objective. And so whenever you hear PN or purpose and need, um, it's being referred to as, and this is a quote from the final environmental impact statement, uh, the purpose of the Moffett Collection System Project is to develop 18,000 acre feet per year of new firm yield to the Moffett Treatment Plant and raw water customers upstream of the Moffett Treatment Plant pursuant to the Board of Water Commissioners' commitment to its customers. Um, that particular phrasing um, is, is a bit too narrow to be a um, legitimate purpose and need for a project. Uh, you can't make your purpose and need so narrow because uh, the purpose and need is the basis on which all of the alternatives, all the different ways of achieving your goal are weighed. And if you specifically say, I need X amount of water at X treatment plant, um, that's in violation. Of, of that uh, standard which has been argued in, in court many times and all those references are in the uh, letter, comment letter. Um, so that's the first problem. Uh, if you broaden that purpose and need a little bit, you suddenly find that a lot of the 300 alternatives that were uh, analyzed suddenly become much more viable. Um, along those same lines, uh, the cost of the project uh, is not uh, accurately represented between the final environmental effects statement and the uh, FERC application, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is another permit that's required for the project. Uh, the FERC application um, shows a total cost of the project somewhere around $360 million versus um, the EISs, the draft and the final, which both talk about about $140 million, if I remember right. So there's a significant difference between those two pricings and um, that really doesn't make any sense unless um, you look at uh, part of the criteria for choosing the preferred alternative out of those 300 is the price consideration. And so if you can find a way to reduce the cost in the proposal in the environmental impact statement, uh, then what would otherwise not be a viable alternative can be turned into a viable alternative because of cost considerations. So that's definitely something that needs to be um, really clearly explained and spelled out in a response from the Army Corps. Um, the argument of this being a um, way to get water to the north end of Denver's system, 
right? The, the argument is that the south end of their system, it's so dependent on their south end of the system because that's where the majority of their water coming from. So they want to have more water go to the northern end of the system to the Moffitt Treatment Center, uh, treatment facility. Um, the problem with that argument is that uh, this project um, of enlarging gross and sending that water down to um, Moffitt, while it sounds like it takes care of the problem, the reality is based on the environmental impact statement, it doesn't actually um, perform that function um, because there are additional diversions in this uh, proposal and those are uh, through the Roberts Tunnel entering the south system and they are more than twice that coming through the Moffitt Tunnel. So when you look at the project as an entire proposal, it's actually a minority of the project that's seeking to fulfill that uh, need that's stated in the purpose and needs statement of getting water to the north end of their system. So that argument may not be uh, entirely legitimate. Um, the um, use of data throughout the environmental impact statement is, is very um, dubious. There's uh, intermixing of mean and median uh, wherever it makes sense. Mean is where you take everything and add together. Median is where you cut off the outliers. Uh, in the world of water flows, there's a lot of outliers, and you get much more accurate measurements when you stick to median, which is what the USGS does, um, and often what environmental impact statements do. However, in this case, they toggle between the two intermittently depending on which one is going to perform which function to meet whatever desired outcome they have for that calculation. Um, the um, blatant um, rejection of there being a viable scientific method for uh, addressing climate change and, and applying a climate change model to the stream flows, uh, I find personally a little troubling because uh, since 2009 there's been very established models for Colorado water diversions in the upper Colorado River. So really I think that maybe somebody isn't um, applying the most current information uh, to that statement. Also warrants mentioning that the statement is identical from the draft EIS, so it was not uh, looked at again. As was the um, calculation of the cost of the project. And so if the cost didn't change from 2010 to 2014, a penny, well, then maybe that's not the most accurate cost prediction because we, we have had inflation. Um, there are numerous, and I could go on for 104 pages, um, but instead I would just like to say that we will continue to submit um, information to you until the decision is made. Uh, I know that in response, uh, well, let's say immediately after Senator Bennett uh, chimed in and said that he thought that Boulder County and City of Boulder warranted an extension to the comment period, uh, the Army Corps, in fact, the same day, the Colonel responded and said that they will give um, substantive comment, um, you know, a reading, a read over before a decision is made. That isn't any uh, deviation from how it normally goes, they're, they're required to take substantive comment into consideration. So they didn't actually bend on that at all. I think it was just a press piece to try and recognize that, yes, they heard the senator and that was their way of responding. Um, but I do think it's worth noting that they didn't budge at all. And uh, since we have a terrifically long evening, I'll end now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, working our way through the pool time, we'll start with Anita Wilkes. And Anita has um, three folks who've signed up with her. Karen, April, and Lynn, if you just kind of raise your hand, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Hi. I'm Anita Wilkes. I live at 76 Pine Road in Colcrete Canyon. I have lived in Colcrete Canyon for 36 years. I wish to commend the commission on their efforts to hold the U.S. Army Corps to task for not listening to our collective concerns regarding the draft EIS and bringing to light some of the many flaws in the FEIS. But it is nearly irrelevant that the comment period for the FEIS was not extended. Nowhere does it state in law, by law, that our comments after the DIS will matter. Project manager Rena Brand gives lip service only by saying any substantive comments will be taken until the project is approved. This only means they won't admit our comments don't matter. While they gave us four alternatives initially, Denver Water and URS, in collusion with the Army Corps, has never truly considered anything other than a full increase of gross reservoir and dam to its proposed capacity. The reasons have never been disclosed publicly, 
but I believe the EPA's veto of the Two Forks Dam started the impetus for this proposed project. There are a multitude of legal facts available for litigation to fight this environmentally damaging proposed project. Not to say the least is the conflict of interest that an environmentally questionable corporation, URS, has composed both fatally flawed DEIS and FEIS. But the fact that they are being paid to draw up these massive documents and also that they stand to benefit from the largest construction project in Boulder County history. The EPA has written several letters to the Corps giving ripe legal drawbacks to Denver Water's attempt, yet again, to harvest West Slope water for frivolous usage on the Front Range. They may have the water rights, all nicely paid for and purchased so long ago, few of us were alive then. But what they don't have is the legal right to break the National Environmental Policy Act or the Clean Water Act. It has been a gross injustice to keep us all fighting against a state utility that has no incentive to really conserve our most precious resource. When they brag that they only rely on water rates and new tap fees, why in the world should they ever really conserve any water they take? They will never give up their effort to drain the Colorado River until Denver Metro itself changes how Denver Water does their business. While that is not our job, our job is to not allow this magnitude of a project in our county. Boulder County has a history of being a leader in environmentally wise actions, and this is a prime example of knowing environmental right from wrong. Last fall, Denver Water did a study on the only haul route to be used should this project be approved. With 18 wheelers and helicopters, they choreographed what vehicles needed to increase the reservoir and dam would entail. The video was available for a time on their website, showing full well that none of the roadways Highway 72 or Gross Dam Road in Coal Creek Canyon could provide a safe or navigable route. Comments for the public were solicited, and when they admitted the haul route wouldn't support the project, they also admitted that, that at least two years of road construction would be needed even before the project. So add those two years to the five to seven of the actual proposed project and in no world would this be deemed temporary or minor negative impacts on the adjacent community and its inhabitants. Our quality of life is at stake, and we implore our elected officials to help us stop this proposed project in every way you can. The real need, the real purpose, new development, won't be disclosed by Denver Water. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Buchanan, followed by Jeff Elliott. And these are both, uh, again, pool times. Can I sit here? Yes. Okay. Just make sure the mic is close enough so that we can all hear you. Hi, I'm Lisa Buchanan. Um, I'm part of TEG. I did, a, among other things, I did an independent firm yield analysis of the reservoir because this is what they're purpose is, is to um, glean 18,000 more acre feet per year um, out of the surface water system on the western slope combined with storage in the 72,000 acre foot enlarged gross reservoir. Oh, and I'm a Boulder resident and I go up to Grand County frequently and this is a dear to my heart. So in the EIS, there's a screening criteria, LP2. And in order, to the screening criteria, you evaluate the different alternatives that they come up with. And if they meet the screening criteria, then they go forward with a more detailed evaluation. So one of the screening criteria were, um, you can read it, but the, the water needs to be available and um, at a sufficient frequency to satisfy the needs. In other words, there needs to be enough water in the basins to provide the 18,000 acre feet per year. And they also had a statement in there that the, it would be insufficient 
if they did not meet the 18,000 acre feet between storage and water supply at a frequency of more than one year out of four. So if they missed their firm yield in more than one year out of four, then the screening criteria did, would screen the alternative and it should not be considered further. So I um, then looked at other firm yield definitions. Um, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection has a long guidance document about how you look at firm yield in different water supply systems. And you know it's pretty ironic because in the East Coast they have a lot of water. And out here, Colorado doesn't have a guidance document like that, um, but they should because we're, we're scraping the bottom of the bucket for the water supply and um, they should. But the difference between what the EIS says and what the New Jersey guidance says is New Jersey says they need to be able to supply that firm yield every year. And the EIS says you can, well, you can miss it some years. Here we are in Colorado in the western, you know. So I just want to reiterate, you know, show you, again, a map that you've seen before. Excuse me. Oh, sorry, you can move it away a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> this is the um, Fraser River. And the green line here is the diversion aqueduct that Denver Water has in the Fraser River. So they have diversion structures on all of these um, tributaries coming in to this uh, aqueduct. And the water is diverted along it all the way to the Moffat Tunnel. From the Moffat Tunnel, it goes east to South Boulder Creek and into Gross Reservoir. So as you can see, there's, it's a far, like, far extensive uh, diversion system. It takes pretty much all of the water, well, it will if they enlarge the reservoir, um, but it has the capacity to take all the water in the upper basin in the Fraser. And this is the Williams Fork right here. There's four main diversions in the upper Williams Fork. Also note that the USGS gauge is here are downstream of these diversion structures on each of the tributaries, so we don't have an accurate, um, accurate data on the amount of water that's going past the diversion structures. So uh, again, these are the diversion points that Denver has in the Fraser Valley, and these are the ones in the Williams Fork Valley. The Williams Fork the water flows through the Gumlick Tunnel and then into the Vasquez Tunnel, into Vasquez Creek, and ultimately through the Moffat Tunnel to the east slope. So let me go back. In the EIS, there are many different diversions. They've, they've done incremental um, increases in diversions. There's one that isn't even mentioned in the EIS. That's the one that's embedded in the current condition Paxim model. And if you want more information on the Paxson model, I'll be happy to talk about it. But for now, um, there's a historical average diversions from 1984 to 2013. That number is 7,267 acre foot per year less than what they have coming out of the basins under their current condition modeling. That modeling is used as the baseline for their cum cumulative um, impacts. And so, this is an extra diversion that they don't account for. It's, it's just in thin air. Then the next step they use is full use. Uh, that's additional 2,700 acre feet per year. And then in the proposed project, there's 10,000 more acre feet coming out. The um, EIS says that they are only responsible for the impacts in this last step. They do not. They do not think they should be responsible for any impacts on the earlier diversions. So this is one way of obfuscating the total impact on the western slope. About half of the diversions they don't account for and they don't take responsibility for. Uh, sorry, I, the lines didn't come through. But um, this is the Fraser River at Winter Park USGS gauge and the average um, or the, excuse me, the median flow prior to any diversions is 31,000 plus acre feet per year. After they started diverting in 1936, the, um, the median was reduced to 11,000 
plus acre feet per year on an annual basis. Since the diversions take place mainly in the irrigation season, the, the, the depletion due to the current diversions with the smaller reservoir, the current smaller reservoir, is between 70 and 80 percent depletion at this point in the Fraser River. That's major. Um, and so the question is, here we are down at this average down here, how are they going to utilize a reservoir that's three times larger than the current one with only 20 to 30 percent of the basin flows that are remaining in the basin? So um, I decided to do this firm yield analysis to see, well, does it really work? And um, the first thing I had to do is estimate what the flows would be, the excess flows that they have remaining at their diversion gates. And this is, a, this is my methodology. You may not want to go into the detail, but basically it, it includes their operations and the storage in the current reservoir. And that combined, I could determine when they could divert water, excess water above what they were doing now, and when they couldn't. If the reservoir now was not, um, not full, there wasn't any excess flow. And so using those two things, I was able to make an estimate of what the excess flow would be in the basin that they could use for additional diversions. And this gives you more of the details. I think you'll have this. You can look at it in more detail later. So then I took the uh, additional storage space, 72,000 acre feet of expanded reservoir, and every year, there was some storage left over from the year before, plus the, the flows that would come in from the basin in the, second, in the next year. And then every year, I subtracted 18,000 acre feet per year, which is the firm yield that they want to supply. And I had the time period from 1966 to 2013 because I had data in every single location that I needed data. And so I, I calculated on a yearly basis how often they got the 18,000 acre feet and tallied it up. And um, these were my results. So from the current modeling to the proposed modeling, they claimed that almost 13,000 acre feet per year would be diverted. Um, in mine, I calculated 15,000 plus. For this situation, the reservoir only filled, the expanded one only filled three years out of 44, and they were slightly below the criteria for the LP2 at 72.2% of the time when they actually made the firm yield. If you go down and say, well, this is how much they say they're going to need for their goal, and I actually had this much from my analysis, it filled only one year out of 44, and it was far from meeting the LP2 criteria, far from it. Maybe 50% of the time they met their goal. And so if you look at this, this alternative should have been screened at the beginning. It should never have made it forward. So one more thing is there is the water available in the basin. I calculated that it takes 4,000 more acre feet per year. But anyway, they need all their water and they need to address the impacts from taking all the water. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Elliott, um, folks, um, hey. Please, um, let's refrain from the applause. There are, are many different um, thoughts and ideas in the room, and so uh, we'd like to try to stay as balanced as we can. So thanks, thanks for that. Um, uh, Jeff Elliott. And you have Bruce, Mike, and Alex. You just raise your hands. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jeff Elliott. I am the Earth Scientist with Grand Environmental Services. I live in Grand Lake. I am uh, one of the uh, West Slope representatives here. I was. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Teg on as a technical advisor through their process, and. Um, uh, I was able to build on the work that Lisa did in terms of how much water was available. And um, we decided since we, excuse me, since we did not have much time <clears throat> to go through the 16,000 pages, 
we decided to cut in and look at one particular issue, and that issue is uh, wetland impacts on the West Slope, which is my own professional expertise. And in particular, if you remember, Lisa showed the pictures of the, uh, the maps of the diversion system. So between the diversion system and Hot Sulphur Springs, Byers Canyon, which is my geographic uh, area of expertise. And uh, looking at this, it really does shed light on the process and uh, the quality, if you will, of the actual document and whether or not one could actually make a reasonable, intelligent uh, decision based upon this. Um, there's a lot of information here that I'll let you look at uh, in the future, but um, we, I, I wanted to focus on the, there's a technical controversy here that's really quite fascinating. It turns out that with the preliminary draft document, the uh, US EPA pointed out that uh, the Corps had missed a fundamental aspect of hydrology. That is, that streams and riparian systems work hand in hand, back and forth. And the Corps said, uh, no, we didn't. We didn't miss anything at all. The draft EIS came out, and the Corps had not changed that opinion. Their opinion is water only comes from the land into the river. So therefore, if you take water out of the river, you don't affect wetlands, is the essential argument. And so uh, you can read through this, but uh, they go back and forth, and the Corps adamantly argues that that is not the case. So it's a, it's a fundamental um, process where if uh, it, it's true that water does flow downhill. If the river climbs a little bit, then the water in the river is uphill from the water in the riparian zone. There it is. And that does indeed affect wetlands. Um, also of interest is that this is, it completely contradicts the chief hydrologist of the USGS. So uh, in this case, Robert Hirsch at that time, the, this is the chief hydrologist. This is the hydrologist that essentially answers to the president, so the top dog in the world of water. And uh, he argues in this one document that water, of course, is going back and forth. We call it conjunctive flow. I'm going to uh, blast through here a couple things you can see. Excuse me, everyone. So. Again, the, the core is arguing that the water flow is only from the land and snow melt into the river. Therefore, if you take water out of the river, it doesn't affect the wetlands. Therefore, there's no wetland impact on the west slope. So we had a chance. This was a very big uh, runoff year. This is just about uh, a week ago or so. So in Hot Sulphur Springs, this is the Colorado River at flood stage, and we were able to do a transect between the river and some of the riparian zone on the outside. We happen to have this very nice new uh, environmental education center, and what you're seeing is a very simple pit that was dug in there, and there's picnic tables, and this is a place for kids to uh, learn about water. When we dug this, it was dry. And as the water comes up in the river, this is 45 feet away from the river at this time, and it's a little hard to tell, but there's actually a well in there because we want to chase the water as it goes on down. So we're measuring water flows at the USGS gauge, that we get that, and we're measuring the elevation of the river and the pond right here. And then um, this is about um, 350 feet away from the river with no surface uh, connection at all. And that's actually um, basket number four on the disc golf course, those of you who have played there in hot sulfur. Uh, it's quite unusable at this particular time. Or it's, it's actually just a major hazard, I guess. But in this, case, in this case, the water actually came up about a foot in about five days as the river came up. And then, of course, this is that dynamic that we think of with vernal uh, pools where uh, the water is coming up in the system and it's growing. In that case, there's some uh, horsetail and some sedges and some other things like that, also starting to be mosquitoes. But again, there's no surface connection at all. So again, remember, the core is arguing that this doesn't happen, okay? Now, it turns out if you look at the actual data plotted, if you look at the blue line on the top there, that's, the, um, that's a stake in the river, and I'm just measuring the elevation of the water, um, and they're all uh, calibrated to a, um, a local control point. And it's, it's climbing up for this peak, and then it, it and then it drops down gently. The red is the uh, environmental education point that I was pointing out to you. And it also, you notice it follows it just, and these are, um, those are five-day increments there. So the water in the riparian zone is very much following the river, up with the river. 
The green line is about 100 feet away, and it's attenuated is the term. It's slowed down and takes a little while for the water to get over there. And, um, and it, it actually climbs up and steadies out when it hits a culvert and pours out. And then the big peak on the green is actually when it, the river flooded and just took over the whole area there. And then the purple is actually 200 feet away. So the end result, you've got to understand, this water is communicating is the technical term. There's an intimate communication between the river and the riparian zone, contrary to what the Corps is arguing. So the FEIS is predicated upon this not being true. Uh, Lisa just went through this, um, some of this information. If you look at January, February, March, April there on the left, we're already at drought flows right now in Hot Sulphur Springs. And if you look at, for instance, May and, uh, and June there, the proposal is to go from the blue to the red, which is a little bit more than halfway towards permanent drought. So what Denver is proposing, and this is their data, they are proposing permanent drought on the West Slope with junior water rights, by the way. They're not at all senior to the ranchers up there. So um, there's quite a bit of information in terms of our, um, our conclusions here, but uh, a few of them are, as Lisa just said, we're talking 75 to 90 percent of the water coming to the east from the west. Um, that's significant in terms of processes, uh, conjunctive flow, hydrogeochemistry, habitat, et cetera. It's quite, you have to, in fact, all of our ecological models really fall apart when you start to take everything. It's sort of like close to death. You know, you re we really don't know exactly. But we do know we're losing critical groundwater recharge. So um, again, you'll have time to look at this uh, in the uh, near future, I hope. But we're talking about 100 miles of rivers being sub severely depleted, significantly is the NEPA term. Um, and some of those streams are depleted up to 100%, dry, dead, bone dry, nothing. That's a significant impact to irrigation, just as a offsite, uh, out of the 1,600 acres that we believe minimum would be losing recharge, uh, we think there's at least 725 acres that would be um, difficult to irrigate now. We end up with 850 acres of um, riparian uh, impact, and then we believe at least 300 acres of wetlands will be significantly affected by this project. This is not disclosed in the EIS at all. There's a little bit of, there is some discussion, but there's no tabulation as if they don't have to mitigate, if they don't have to acknowledge it, et cetera. And um, let me end with uh, some eye candy here. Um, this is 400 feet away from the Colorado River. No surface impact at all. And right now, it's a good time to go up to Hot Sulphur Springs because the irises are just going crazy with all this extra water. It's a, very, it's a, very, a lot of water this year. So iris is a, it's a fact wet, it's a, a seasonal wetland plant. It needs to be very wet and then it dries out later on. So this is the periphery of what's going on up there. So there might be a million of these, this one species out there, I suppose. Um, this is what's being ignored while they press for additional water to this side it is not disclosed and it is not shared and they're not uh, proposing to do any mitigation for it. Thank you very much for taking a hard look at this. We really appreciate it. Uh, you're doing a lot of that. We wish people on the West Slope were doing as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, Judith Green, followed by Jeff Thompson. And Judith has uh, 10 minutes. And with her are Bob, Kristen, Leslie. If you'd raise your hands. And yeah, can't read the second one. Andy. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and would you give us your name and address? Yes, start? but don't start yet. I have a handout. You have a hand? Okay, but yeah. <laughs> Michelle's keeping an eye on things, so we should be good. I'm sorry. She's hitting the buttons over there, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, and I want to thank the folks who gave me the added time. <laughs> Helps me a lot. Anyway, it's interesting. Here we are again. Give us your name and address oh. for the record, please. Yes, thank you. It's Judith Green, 141 Skyline Drive, Golden, 
8043, and I'm a member of TEG as well. Anyway, I started to say, here we are again. Uh, but it's different this time, because this time we're talking about the final environmental impact statement. So no more guessing about what Denver Water or the core will say. We now know that the, um, the, the project itself, as well as the FEIS, are deficient. In your response, you pointed out that federal regulations require that the project be, I'll try to say this right, the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative, which led by for short. And as you noted in the letter, it's very hard to tell. We don't know for sure if the project is the LEDPA. In fact, all of the alternatives that were selected to be studied <coughs> in the FEIS involve the enlargement of gross reservoir. This is because the key elements of the purpose of the project, and now remember, purpose determines the alternatives. That's how that works. The key elements of that purpose, as you've, you know and you've heard us say here before today, is 18,000 acre feet firm yield to the Moffat treatment plant, okay? All of the water that goes to that treatment plant comes from gross reservoir. So therefore, the outcome was absolutely inevitable from the beginning with that particular purpose, which was it had to, it had to include the expansion of gross reservoir. And that is exactly what happened. So it's highly likely that the LEDPA was eliminated or in fact, it was never proposed. In fact, conservation was rejected as a viable alternative. Why? Because it doesn't bring water to the Moffat treatment plant. So you can see how limiting that is. So we must then take a look at the validity of that need, that 18,000 acre feet firm yield, and the necessity to bring that water to the treatment plant. You rightly asked in your letter for a more robust discussion of the need and the purpose of the project that are, as Chris already pointed out, so narrowly defined. And this is, by the way, contrary to NEPA and the Clean Water Act regulations. So narrowly defined that viable alternatives were eliminated. I consider that a fatal flaw, I'm sure. The need for 18,000 new water comes from a projected shortfall of 18,000 feet by 2032. The 18,000 acre feet is a derived number. It's based on five other numbers. And if you take a look at this, the table now, column three, come all the way down to the bottom, there's the 18,000 acre feet. And if you, if you sort of glance back up, you'll see that this is derived from many, many other numbers. But they themselves are speculative. They're model driven. And so I, I come to the conclusion from really trying to figure out what are those numbers, where do they come from, that the 18,000 acre feet is actually quite questionable. It's hard to know. But to add to that, the demand model itself, which generated some of these numbers, is highly flawed. And you'll have a chance to study that um, when you get a chance to look at our response, because we go into detail about that. <clears throat> so we can't trust the 18,000 acre foot shortfall, and yet, here's the crucial thing. The need for the project and the size of the reservoir are based on that number. That's crucial. Secondly, the dire need to bring that new supply to the Moffat treatment plant is also highly questionable. And we went into some detail in that in our response. But for example, Denver Water has a very flexible system. The South system has two treatment plants, and the case is that either one of those can handle complete demand at any time. So that's worth looking into. But Denver Water claims that without the added water sitting in the reservoir, the entire delivery system is seriously in jeopardy. And this is why. 
because if the entire south system should fail in the summer during a drought, with landscape watering taking a huge amount of treated water, there would be a problem. That is true. And that somehow the added water in gross reservoir would save the system. First of all, it wouldn't. I think it's been demonstrated here already. There isn't enough water. It wouldn't work. But secondly, building a destructive process on the basis of this kind of a what-if scenario, I think is folly. Also note that the dire consequences of the no action alternative, which had to be examined, with this kind of a what-if scenario is portrayed as absolutely catastrophic. <laughs> if you had a chance to read this part of the massive document, this might even include political takeover of Denver water. <laughs> That's in there under the no action consequences. But in fact, the no action has two basic elements to it. The one is drawing down the strategic water reserve. Okay, this is a very important part of the whole Denver water system. This reserve, the reserve is huge. And I have on the bottom of the handout um, a, a diagram, a graph showing that reserve. It is 200,000 acre feet of reserved water, or in other words, 50,000 acre feet firm yield. But repeatedly, under the no action, alternative. It says that, gee, we're going to have to draw down on that reserve of 30,000 acre feet. It isn't 30,000. Now, it turns out, in more careful reading, the 30,000 is actually firm yield. But nonetheless, now the actual reserve is 50,000 acre feet, not 30. But you get the impression that the reserve is actually quite small when you read the FEIS. Obviously, the Corps doesn't know that Denver Water made that reserve 50,000 acre feet for meal a few years ago. In fact, it did so because there is so much water available in the south system. Now, that water could be delivered into the north system, into the treatment plant. That alternative was rejected. The second part of the no action is called severe mandatory restrictions. And it's a bit of a joke. It's a bit of nonsense because Denver water always restricts landscape watering during a drought. And water goes significantly down. Water use goes down. Now, to summarize this point, the purpose and need of the project are questionable. But they are used to create the alternatives as required by NEPA and as required by the um, Clean Water Act to determine the LEDPA. Furthermore, the purpose and need are used to determine criteria for eliminating alternatives. So this is the heart of the issue. If the purpose and need are narrow, then the criteria will also be narrow and alternatives will be eliminated because of that. And that's precisely what happened. In addition, the 404 of the Clean Water Act goes even further. It says, if, there is a, if the project is, a non, is non water dependent, and the Moffat project is that, and yet the project affects sensitive aquatic sites, which it does, then the Corps must demonstrate that there is no other alternative to be chosen. The Clean Water Act presumes that there is such an alternative, and the core must prove that there is not. It must prove that presumption wrong, and the core fails to do this. I think that's a fatal flaw. In summary, the purpose of the project does not justify the destruction on both sides of the Continental Divide, and neither NEPA nor the Clean Water Act regulations have been met. I think you can reject this project on failure to demonstrate need, and on very sound legal grounds. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jeff Thompson, followed by um, 
Philip Doe's. And Jeff, you've got 10 minutes. Philip, you have six. And folks that are joining time, um, is it Kesson? Kesson? If you'd raise your hands. Beverly, Kit, Jack. So I've got 10. You 10 do. big minutes? 10 minutes. Great. Um, because just after hearing the work Can that, you give uh, us your name and address for the record, oh, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, Jeff Thompson, 1616 Sumner Street, Longmont, Colorado. Just hearing the uh, work for the first time that TEG has done, I have to say that my head is spinning right now because I've been working on some of these same things. Um, just because of my legal training, uh, what I like to do is kind of sort through and decide what, what the issues are, what we need to argue about, and what has already been decided. And uh, maybe I should say at the outset, because I think this is very important as to what Boulder County needs to do as Boulder County now, is um, I've read all the EPA, EPA's um, comment letters uh, on the DEIS, and then they wrote a letter called a will effect letter, which is a letter under Section 404Q of the Clean Water Act, which is basically the road to an EPA veto of the project. And in that um, will effect letter, they said that this project will have an unacceptable negative impact on the aquatic resources of the United States, and it cannot be permitted under the 404B1 regulations. And the EPA wrote the 404B1 regulations, and the courts will, of course, defer to the EPA's interpretation of the 404B1 regulations. And then the EPA uh, submitted their comments on the final environmental impact statement, and the EPA has they looked at the mitigation that has been proposed. It was, I call it the mitigation pull pourri or the um, conceptual mitigation, which had no details. NEPA requires in it that the impact statement have the details so that you can make some analysis as to whether or not this mitigation would actually lower the impacts. Uh, but it, regardless of that, the EPA said they looked at that and they said there's no way that with mitigation you can lower the impacts on the aquatic resources of the United States to an acceptable level. So that's where we are. I mean, that permit, that 404 permit, cannot be issued except for one thing. In those, I think it's in the 404B1 regulations or incorporated into them in some other regulations, <laughs> there is this um, idea of compensatory mitigation, which is basically um, that the EPA is saying under the Clean Water 404, Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, that it's basically quid pro quo that the project can provide to the people of the United States to basically buy their way out of this, to basically pay for the negative impacts, the unacceptable impacts. And so the EPA has said in their letters that Move your mic down. the environmental impact statement has to be transparent about all mitigation, and it's not. In fact, the EPA says in their most recent letter that they weren't even included in these mitigation discussions. But basically, the way this is going to go down, I mean, I think this has all been decided. Uh, Denver Water, I've got the, the court documents to show that this EIS, this whole process has been controlled by Denver Water. It's an applicant prepared EIS and it's going to be an applicant granted section 404 permit based on compensatory mitigation. And Boulder County has 
the only way to stop that from happening is somebody has got to get the Army Corps to comply with NEPA procedures. If you look at the EPA letters that they've been written, the draft environmental impact statement, the, according to the EPA, was not um, sufficient to provide a meaningful analysis of the impacts. And the NEPA regulations say that under those circumstances, the Army Corps must prepare a revised draft statement and circulate it for comments on the record to which the Army Corps has to respond on the record. And then you go another step. Of course, they, Denver Water is controlling this, and Denver Water said no to that. And then they come out with this draft environmental impact statement or final environmental impact statement, and it says on page two in italics for emphasis that there's all kinds of new information in this final statement relevant to environmental consequences and environmental concerns. Well, the NEPA regulations say very clearly that when there's new information like that, that the core has to prepare a supplement to the draft and circulate it like a draft to get public comments on the record to which the Corps has to respond. And Denver Water said, no, you can't do that. And Denver Water has basically hijacked this whole process. And so the Corps didn't do that. You can write all the comments you want, all these wonderful TEG comments. I wrote eight pages of comments in there. They're, all the comments that have been submitted so far, I can guarantee you they will never be read by anybody at the Army Corps. The Army Corps will just turn them over to Denver Waters consultant, URS, and say, here, you read them. I don't think the Army Corps even has staff confident to understand any of this. But the only way you can, this train has left the station, and the, the only way that this can be stopped is somebody, and I'm hoping and praying maybe the county will step up and file a very simple complaint in federal district court down in Denver and say that these procedures that I just described were not followed. And then go further and ask the court to um, make sure that in the draft, the revised draft or the supplemental draft that has to be, still has to be prepared and circulated for comment um, that they in, include um, certain things. Uh, how am I doing on time? I, I want to say one thing that um, was brought up to me out in the lobby before this. There are a lot of people up around Gross Reservoir that are um, very, that have, you know, they, they live on well water and they're very concerned just about the blasting that's going to be going on and the fact that they're going to uh, drain gross reservoir. We just heard how surface water affects groundwater and, and that sort of thing. Um, they're very concerned about the impacts on their wells just during the construction phase, and I hope the county will look at that. I don't think there was anything in the EIS about that, and so that's um, uh, something to look at. Um, I have the... Um, Denver Water's need, the last person to speak was t talking about purpose and need. Um, it's basically three components in the EIS. It's city and county of Denver, suburbs that are part of Denver Water's consolidated service area that they serve as a, a utility, and then there are these fixed amount contracts. If you look at the charter for Denver Water, which is Article 10 of the city charter for the city and county of Denver, um, these fixed amount contracts are just surplus water leases. Sometimes you call them leases, sometimes you call them contracts. It's the same thing, but they're surplus water. And the charter says that these contracts have to have a curtailment provision such that if Denver Water needs the water for the consolidated service area, it will, um, uh, they will curtail deliveries to the fixed amount contracts. Uh, they have contracts like this. And this is about where this water is going and it, this insane development in the northwest quadrant of the metro area. One of these fixed amount contracts, um, well, Arvada has 
fixed amount contracts in the amount of 22,000 acre feet, Westminster 4,500, North Table Mountain Water District 6,000 acre feet, and Broomfield 6,500 acre feet for a total of 38,500. Endeavor Water can cur curtail those contracts, and we don't know what the impact would be on these cities because the EIS says nothing about the other water supply that these cities and water districts have. So we have no idea how much water is available that basically go off like a time bomb for this disastrous development that's planned for the Northwest Quadrant. Thank you. Philip Doze. And then I think we'll, uh, we're about halfway through the pool time. We'll switch to do uh, a set of individual speakers. And the first one that would be up would be Joe Wern. Thank you. So you're ready. Say hi. My name is Philip Doe. I live at 7140 South Depew in Littleton, Colorado. In a previous life, um, I was in charge of water policy for the Bureau of Reclamation and actually wrote the largest uh, EIS ever undertaken by the Department of Interior on water subsidies to Western agriculture. Uh, that's my background, so I guess I have a little background on this subject. Um, we at Be The Change, where I work, I'm the environmental director for Be The Change, we've asked the Corps of Engineers a number of times to do sensitivity analysis on their yield figures. We did this primarily with Chatfield, which was right in my backyard, but the same applies here. And we do it because of climate change. They've declined to do that because it was said it was too dicey. Well, that's our point. <laughs> they get our point, but they don't, won't do what they should do. If they understand it's dicey, they should be looking at their yield projections because we don't think they'll be there. It's almost imperative that they won't be there. Uh, the Bureau of Reclamation in 2012 uh, did some studies on the Colorado River Basin, and this is a very conservative outfit. Trust me, I was there. <laughs> there are no jackpots in that organization. But their, their estimates are that the flows in the Colorado River by 2050 would reduce from 10 to 30 percent. And at 10 percent, you can't meet the present downstream demand. And yet, Denver Water ignores this. Even though we've spent millions and millions of dollars on a state water plan, they continue to ignore what the state water plan says they're going to do. They're going to look at efficiency and conservation. This is neither. This is the same old game. These are old water projects, both Chatfield and Gross, probably 30 years old, and they're under old ideas about how we develop water. We've developed the water in this state, trust me. Do you know how many reservoirs we have in this state? Over 2,100. Do you know how much water we leave use in this state? 16 million acre feet. That's enough water for 160 million people, the residential needs of 160 million people. Even on the Platte River, which we're part of, we have almost 900 reservoirs, and we use 5 million acre feet of water. That is one hell of a lot of water. They don't need gross reservoir enlargement. They need to do what the state water plan says they're supposed to do, and that is look at conservation and some land retirement. Now, the state plan is, and it's even its early iterations, to say they may have to retire, I think, what, 700,000 acres of agricultural land? Well, people throw up their arms, but a lot of that land is used for corn. We don't need corn. It's converted to ethanol. Hardly any, any net benefit in energy. We need to start looking seriously at how we preserve our rivers and take care of the future. And we can do that without building growth, without Chatfield. We just have to change the way we look at things. Another thing I, would, I think they need to consider is a future where the American people and the people of Colorado do not want their rivers dried up. Uh, I think if the Colorado College uh, survey that they do fairly often on the environment was right, 70% of the people in this state want the environment protected. You can't protect the environment by taking over 80% of the flow of the upper Fraser. And if in time a public trust doctrine is adopted in our state constitution. I'm the co-chair co of one of those initiatives. Jared Polis has another. It's not as good as ours, but it's never <laughs> <laughs> but 
if, if that initiative is passed and becomes part of the Constitution, at least with ours, they would have to put that, what, no matter what water they were taking out of the Fraser, they would have to put large parts of it back in to save the river because that would be a command of the state government is to preserve the natural environment. And you can't take 85% out and say you're preserving it. You're destroying it, un unquestionably. I don't think they need to look at that in the EIS, but they should be conscious of what people want, and they sure don't want construction of the environment. It's as simple as that, and this is very, very destructive, both Chatfield and Gross. And you've got five million acre feet of water over here already. What, what this requires is what, three-tenths of one percent. That's hardly a nosebleed in this system. You can't, you've got 900 reservoirs and you can't find that amount of water by increased efficiency in those systems? Of course you could. And it's, it's a no-brainer. And that's what they should be doing. And they've simply ignored that alternative. Because like too many times with the, when the big boys play, they have their idea and they, they wrap NEPA around it. And it doesn't do any good. We need to force them to do the right thing, and that is have a nosebleed. You know, 18,000 acre feet is nothing in a system that uses 5 million acre feet in the plat. Thanks. Thank you. Joe Byrne, followed by Ted Ross. My name is Joe Wern, and I am at 518 Arbor Drive in Lafayette, Colorado. I am a uh, research scientist at Northwest Research Associates, and I've lived in Boulder County for 22 years. Um, the final environmental impact statement of 16,000 pages, if you were to stack it on the ground, it would be as tall as I am. We joke about saving uh, sheets of paper uh, saving a tree by not printing sheets of paper. If five people printed that to make comments on it, we would actually kill a tree. Um, 16,000 pages reviewed in 45 days is 355 pages a day. That's a novel a day for 45 days. That's not very interesting. That's technically detailed. There would be no way to analyze the content and give an informed reply. Um, I think there should be an environmental impact study on printing the environmental impact statement. <laughs> so th that leads me to a suspicion that the invitation for comment is a ruse, that this is collusion by big business and a government agency uh, to bury citizens in paperwork while doing the bidding of people who are already wealthy to make them wealthier. That's all that's going on. This is really the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative. Uh, Denver water currently uses three and a half times that amount of water, uh, treated potable water, to pour on the ground. We use it to, to water lawns in an already arid environment. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, and the reason we don't consider it, it's been mentioned already, it's, uh, it's the statement of the purpose and need. You know, it's just contrived. You can easily find that amount of water. The last point I want to make is the Fraser River, taking it down to zero, which is clearly what's been demonstrated by the analysis that we talked about, severely impacts the livelihood of the people dependent on the river. I, ne I realize they're not in Boulder County, but eventually we have to deal with the fact that it's a limited resource. And do we want to wait until we dry up the rivers before we deal with it? It's just crazy. This is crazy. Okay, that's, that's the comments I had. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Ted Ross, followed by uh, Richard Hamilton. Good evening. My name is Ted Ross. I am a resident of 2855 Lynx Drive in North Boulder. I am a concerned citizen, and I am a representative of an organization called the Colorado Ocean Coalition which is a few thousand like-minded individuals here in the state of Colorado who are concerned about enviro environmental issues that impact the oceans, the watersheds, and the water cycle, you know, really around the world. Um, the environmental impact statement is on the table, has a series of issues that we've all, few have already dis discussed. 
clearly the diversion of the Fraser River is nonsensical to move water from one side of the Continental Divide to the other. That, that's been discussed. Uh, the construction issues of moving a, a million cubic yards of aggregate around uh, is a incomprehensible you know, construction impact in Boulder County over four or five years. And then the entire lack of conservation issues is also just you know, really not representative of the, the culture and ambience of what these environmental issues should be today. I think there's two other issues that maybe are trivial but have not been mentioned. One is the thought of uh, flood impact. You know, what is 72,000 acres of, or acre feet of water going to do in the South Boulder Creek watershed? Uh, in the construct of a thousand year flood, you know, where's that water going to go and what's the impact, you know, similar to last September? I think that's something the Army Corps of Engineers needs to note. The other one that would seem to deserve some attention is what's the impact of invasive species. You know, we have pine bark meat beetles going up and down the, the mountains. We have emerald ash borers. You know, we have termites. We have fire ants. You know, what is moving those 200,000 dead trees going to do for environmental species? I, we didn't see a word of that anywhere in the impact statement. So where does that put us? Um, clearly, we have a little bit of a hammer looking for a nail problem. Denver Water, Army Corps of Engineers, what they do is large-scale water projects. So clearly, every bit of analysis they have is going to be how to substantiate, support, encourage, and promote a large-scale water project. That does not seem to really reflect the, the environment we're in today. What we're here to ask is Boulder County needs to be the counterbalance to that. You know, clearly, sooner or later, we're going to run out of water, and we need to manage with what we have. Our proposition is now is the time to do that. Focus on conservation. Focus on how to preserve you know, the integrity of the watersheds as they are before spending $360 million on what may be a flawed project. And last point, to borrow from the godfather, you know, if Boulder County wants to go to the mattresses and fight this, you know, I think there's going to be a whole lot of environmental people in Colorado and in Boulder County who want to see you do the right thing. I look forward to helping you, you know, take that step. Thank you. Thanks. Richard Hamilton, followed by Jenny Curtis. I would just note while we're getting these handouts that the U.S. just won <laughs> two to one. Nobody thought that could happen. <laughs> Which shows there's always room for hope. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Things can happen. Hope is always helped by talent. <laughs> Thank you for your time. My name is Richard Hamilton. I live on Front Street in Fairplay. <clears throat> uh, here today to be a representative of uh, the water resource uh, area of the southern delivery system of Denver Water. We in South Park have between 25 and 40 million pounds of solution mineable uranium within the source water of the southern delivery system of Denver Water which has been not adequately investigated. It's been the subject of a couple of uh, petitions to the Secretary of Interior under Public Law 9587 uh, indicating unsuitability of mining within that 85 percent of the source water Denver Southern Delivery System. Uh, I've handed out, uh, prepared for this right here, and basically leads off with saying that your um, abilities under the Colorado Land Use Act 2465.1 statutes clearly defined in the case Denver versus Board of, uh, Board of County Commissioners in 1989, which upheld the uh, Grand County's uh, 1041 proceedings on Denver's uh, proposed Water Resource Development, it said in there the, at the Colorado Land Use Act Commission uh, uh, that there was no dispensation uh, for Denver to ignore the uh, 1041 powers of the sovereign county in the state of Colorado. But I'm primarily here today to talk about uh, the thing that I think is missing in this whole controversy, and it really is the purpose and need. In 1972, the Colorado Supreme Court 
uh, in a case called the uh, Denver Water Board uh, versus uh, Fulton Irrigation, what the uh, Colorado Supreme Court indicated was that, let me see if I can get this wording exactly right. It's on page three. It says that water use, water reuse, and subsequent disposition of water by utilities uh, contained within that uh, Fulton Irrigation uh, case allows Denver not to go ahead and say where that final disposition, water reuse, or, or subsequent use of water is going to be. It's really a remarkable kind of finding by the Colorado court. Uh, we do not know, coming out the back end of Denver Metro Surge, that you as a user of uh, water brought to you by a common carrier status of the Denver Water Board, you've been usurped. You, the Denver Water Board is no longer a common carrier. What has transpired is they have been given a water asset, and that asset is subject to water reuse, subsequent use, and sale by Denver Water, and that is not contained within the FEIS. Thank you. Thank you. Jenny Curtis, followed by Yvonne Short. Hi, um, Jenny Curtis, 1239 Lakeshore Drive, so that's the North Shore of Gross Reservoir. Um, commissioners, thank you so much for your leadership and your excellent letter um, to the Army Corps. Um, interestingly, in the FEIS, Denver Water says, uh, quote, Denver Water is working closely with Boulder County to address concerns regarding the temporary construction impacts uh, on the area around Gross Reservoir. And then in your letter, I just want to support you in this, um, in this uh, sentiment that the, your letter, quote, the public deserves binding mitigation measures acceptable to residents regarding impacts to roads, traffic level, levels, traveler safety, access to homes during emergencies, noise, light, etc. cetera. Um, I wanted to point out that Denver Water has not had a conversation with the North Shore residents. In fact, the only time we've seen them recently is when they wanted to do a test quarry uh, site. And they did come up after our having to ask them many times to show us where that uh, test site was. And so we did have a few of the residents go around and look um, at that site. Um, if, um, their Denver Waters management of the recreation area. And I bring this up as an example of what I think we can expect when this project goes on, uh, if this project does take place. Um, the Denver Water is not a good community member by any stretch. Um, and just to give you a couple examples of that, the gross dam road quality is terrible. Uh, <laughs> It is um, uh, Denver Waters responsible for um, that road uh, from the train tracks to Flagstaff Road. They need to keep that, um, uh, excuse me, the, the, um, the road is heavily used by locals and visitors and uh, it's in such poor condition and it's not um, flood damage. So that road is very bumpy and they do have a greater on-site that the, uh, um, that the gross dam caretakers have. Um, another thing, the North Shore folks have asked several times for there to be stronger um, uh, monitoring by rangers. And for instance, we've asked for there to be um, a gate put in at the North Shore at sunset, the recreation facility stop at sunset. And it's not, and they've refused to do that. We've asked for them to extend ranger hours into at least the end of October, um, possibly mid-November when the weather is still lovely and there's still a lot of recreation going on and they've refused to do that. Thank you very much. I think the point being that Denver Water is not a good player and I don't think they're gonna suddenly become a good player. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Yvonne Short. Hi. Hi. My name is Yvonne Short. I live at 618 Aspen Meadows Road, Nederland, Colorado, which is about three, approximately three miles 
from Gross Reservoir. Um, I have been a mountain resident for 33 years, most of that time at my current residence. Um, I have been looking into the URS Corporation because I really didn't know anything about them. And since they're responsible for both of the EIS documents, I wanted to find out. I had no idea what uh, enormous corporation this is. Um, they're a behemoth contracting company worldwide. Isn't there a rather glaring conflict of interest having uh, a company that is known for its enormous building projects worldwide to provide EIS documents? Um, especially clear when the resulting FEIS has severely understated uh, critical areas of our environmental concern. I would really love to see a comparison of an FEIS done by a reputable environmental science group not associated with an enormous contracting organization. I know this isn't likely, but I think it would be very eye-opening. I found that there is a site uh, called the Federal Contractor Misconduct Database. Very interesting. Um, there are numerous records of URS fraudulent activity in various locations in this country. Being an enormous corporation doesn't necessarily mean integrity is always involved. I believe that there is a very good reason to have a valid FEIS done by a group of scientists who are not working for a large contracting corporation. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do one more individual and then switch back to our uh, pool time. So Eric Sween. Eric, if you're still here, there he is. Hi, I'm Eric Sween, and I live 49 Barber Lane, El Dorado Springs. So first of all, thanks for writing that letter. I really appreciated what you put into that um, and felt, yeah, really appreciative of that. Also, for the people who have done a lot of hard work on this issue, really appreciate that as well. Um, I just want to speak a little bit more personally. I live in uh, El Dorado Springs in a cabin on a dirt road that dead ends, and I'm 100 feet from South Boulder Creek. I really feel lucky to live there. I moved in in 1988. I've owned a house there for 21 years. So for three reasons, I really struggle with this project being built. Um, for it to be the largest um, project in Boulder County, it really needs to have strong, strong rationale. And the three reasons I challenge it are, First, the impact on the Fraser River, that being dewatered 75 to 80 percent currently, um, that will have an enormous impact. So in terms of watershed coherence and health, um, it just feels um, like unconscionable to do that. Second reason, another watershed, Coal Creek. I don't live there, but I live in another small community and this project is really going to change that community. It's going to have a huge impact in terms of truck traffic, four years, which it will be built. It will really have a major impact. Third reason is South Boulder Creek, the watershed I live in. I'm really concerned about fish, wildlife, stream flow. And I feel lucky where I live is partly because of the planning that's gone into Boulder County. So I really ask you to do everything you can to oppose this project. Thank you. Thank you. Back to our pool time, Bruce Field. And Bruce, you have um, 10 minutes. If, you'll, if your team will raise their hands, Jamie, JR, Diane. Thank you for letting me speak, by the way. I just found out about this meeting last week from Chris. So I, excuse me if I'm going to be blunt and short, but uh, 
My name is Bruce Field. I live in Arata, Colorado, 6531 Urban Court. I uh, have over 25 years of construction experience with projects like this proposed moth collection system project. I worked for Denver Water for six, year, or six years, 2002 to 2008. I was the senior construction project manager there. I was fired, as two other employees were, because we reported mismanagement, overpayment, and collusion on construction projects like this between the Denver Water Board, senior management, and their contractor friends. I would like to state my concerns on the EIS process, as she mentioned earlier, because it is crucial to have a valid EIS and a process people can trust on a project of this magnitude. This EIS and its process is neither valid nor trustworthy. First, let me be blunt and correctly identify what Denver Water is. It is a corrupted water utility completely controlled by real estate developer interests and their covert friends. This water company has no oversight or control by any entity despite what the Corps of Engineers says and no ties to the city or state government. The Corps claims in an answer to a comment that Denver Water is a not, this is their words, not profit public utility that is governed by Denver City Charter. This is a false and misleading statement. The correct answer is, from a city official, Denver Water is not part of the city and county of Denver government. It is entirely separate and independent entity which is not subject to the Denver Code of Ethics or Denver City Control. That was from a city official when I tried to file a complaint. <clears throat> My concern on that is why does it concern anyone that the Corps and the URS are fabricating false responses to an EIS comment to make Denver water appear to be under the city of Denver's control? That's a big concern in my opinion. Next item, why was URS, a longtime contractor for Denver Water and a dam constructor, selected to do the EIS? The preparer of the EIS is required to be a third party independent consultant with no conflicts of interest. URS clearly is not. Is that acceptable to this group? That's probably why there's a lot of lack of information, as a lot of other people have pointed out. There's an agenda here, and it's Denver Water's agenda. Why was one person at the core allowed to personally select the consultant on this EIS project? This was, of course, the contractor Denver Water dictated to him they wanted. Is this acceptable to this group that one person decide who prepares this critical document? The Corps has shown a history of collusion and mismanagement with companies like Denver Water. During this Moffat EIS process, Bunny Greenhouse, an employee at the Corps, reported mismanagement, corruption, and collusion with the Corps with KRB, a Halliburton company. Instead of being rewarded for pointing this out, she was harassed, threatened, and demoted by the Corps managers. That is how the Corps treats staff who won't go along with the corruption and collusion with companies like Denver Water. This is the same abuse I experienced in 2008 as along with several colleagues. Is that acceptable to this group? In summary, with the brief time available, we have an uncontrolled water utility who purposely selected a questionable consultant to pre prepare this document, which then Denver Water's partner, the local Corps, willingly agreed to. These concerns are just the tip of the iceberg on this corrupted EIS process, and if you want to stop this project, you must also investigate and correct these root cause problems. No action on this project is the only viable choice at this point. My colleagues and I are willing to go into detail on all these items and meet and share our information on Denver water corruption with any concerned citizen or ethical entity and discuss options. Thank you. Thank you. Tegan Blakely, uh, folks please, um, I'd like to ask you not to apply. Tegan Blakely 
And I believe you have 10 minutes as well. So Vicki and John, thank you, and Steve, Stephen. Okay, thanks. My name is Tegan Blakey. I live at 618 Aspen Meadows Road, Netherland. Firstly, I would like to offer you my sincere thanks for your strong and detailed letter to the Army Corps of Engineers regarding the serious flaws in the FEIS. Firstly, I'll be reading a piece on behalf of my neighbor, David Barr, PhD, climate scientist. I am a water resources professional, a climate scientist, PhD, and a contributing author to the 2013 United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. I am well known for inventing the scientific technique used to predict rising sea level from melting glaciers, and as such, I understand all of the science behind melting snowpacks, seasonal runoff, and the impact climate change will have on stream flows. I am highly qualified to evaluate the climate science discussed by the FEIS. The Moffitt FEIS fails to address the possibility of significantly altered Fraser River stream flows due to climate change. Well-respected climate scientists are doing regional assessments, basin level assessments, and sub-basin level highly localized assessments, e.g. Lazar and Williams, 2008, among many references. The authors of the FEIS are clearly unaware of this, but a similar localized assessment should have been done for the Fraser River Valley to assess the potential impact of climate change on the Fraser River stream flows. Using historical stream flow data, as the FEIS does, is entirely inadequate. To justify this inadequacy, the authors of the FEIS incorrectly state that, quote, a generally accepted scientific method by which current climate change information is translated into predictable stream flow changes and assimilated into water supply decision making is still not available. Therefore, the quantitative climate change induced stream flow predictions are not evaluated in this FEIS. Chapter 4, page 47. This appears to be a disingenuous dismissal of modern climate science. At best, the FEIS authors are using out-of-date climate references, in most cases a decade out of date. And a more recent survey of the scientific literature shows that there are many techniques available for addressing long-term stream level forecasts. As two of many published examples are referred you to Wang et al. 2009 and Wang and Robertson 2011, whose techniques are being used successfully to make stream level forecasts by the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. The Wang et al. models are easily coupled with modern global climate models to make reasonable predictions of likely changes to long term seasonal stream flows. Without a stream level and basin level assessment of climate impacts, the FEIS has failed to address highly probable ch changes in stream flows in the Fraser River. Perhaps most important, the FEIS fails to account for the well-known, widely publicized, scientifically accepted, and, and widely discussed dust storms that are increasing in frequency as climate changes. These storms events blanket the snowpack with a layer of dust. The darker dust-covered snow then absorbs up to 65% more sunlight and seasonal runoff behavior is substantially altered. Data shows that due to this dust, the peak melt will happen up to seven weeks earlier in the near future. Painter et al. 2010, Deems et al. 2007, which will mean Denver water has a reduced time to capture peak flows. The reduced time frame may limit Denver water's ability to fill an enlarged gross reservoir. Clearly, the effect of dust on snow should have been included in the FEIS to properly understand and predict seasonal flows in the Fraser River Valley. See Chapter 4, page 45 of the FEIS for a discussion of capacity constraints that limit the ability to fill gross reservoir with an earlier spring runoff. The failure of the Moffitt Collection System, FEIS, to address effects of climate change on the Fraser River stream flows represents a fatal flaw. That is Dave Bars. I would like to add to Dave's comment that, quote, the Corps has been preparing an environmental impact statement since 2003. 
End of quote. If the information used in the EIS has not been updated in those 11 years, it would explain why the FEIS is in most cases using a decade out of date climate references. I will also add that even Denver's Waters website says, quote, a warmer climate will cause the snowpack to melt earlier and will produce an earlier spring runoff. Because the snowpack will melt earlier, we'll have less stream flow in the summer and fall months. In addition, they say, Denver Water is a leader in addressing this topic, in addressing and incorporating climate change into its planning process. So why is this topic not thoroughly addressed in the FEIS? According to American Rivers, climate change is expected to reduce Colorado's rivers flow by 10 to 30 percent by 2050. Warmer weather, less snow, a reduction in stream runoff, and changed timing of spring runoff are all likely impacts. Currently scheduled water deliveries from the Colorado system are not sustainable in the future if climate changes run off even as little as 10 percent. According to the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, which we heard mentioned earlier, in 2012, in partnership with the seven Colorado River Basin states, published the most comprehensive study of future supplies and demands on the Colorado River ever undertaken. The Colorado River Basin Water Supply and Demand Study confirmed what most experts knew. There are likely to be significant shortfalls between projected water supplies and demands in the Colorado River Basin in the coming decades. This was the result of two years of work by the above participants. If Denver Water is unable to fill an expanded reservoir, there is every reason why the Moffitt project should be downscaled or scrapped altogether. We can't keep raising dams if there's no water to fill them. Water conservation, on the other hand, is easy, non-destructive, long-term solution. According to Denver Water, the average person in Denver Water's service area uses 85 gallons of water per day, which is the GPCD. Admittedly, this is low compared with many other cities in the Southwest. However, Buckeye, Payson, and Clarkdale, Arizona, all have lower GPCDs than Denver, ranging from 61 to 73. And according to the London Councils, each Lunder, Londoner uses an average of 44 gallons of water a day. This is, has remained largely unchanged for a decade, but is high compared to the national average of 39.4 gallons of water a day. The Corps says they have analyzed over 250 alternatives, but have not yet chosen the least environmentally damaging practical alternative, which they will now be working to do, do so in the near future. Lowering Denver Water's D GPCD to 40 would cut their current water usage in half. This would be a much greater water savings than the amount of water an expanded gross reservoir could ever provide. In addition to not thoroughly addressing the environmental impacts of the Moffitt Collection System project, the FEIS has also ignored the overwhelming general consensus of voters who prefer water conservation over water diversion. Overall, the low level of water in rivers is viewed as a major problem, second only to unemployment, which tends to be the most dominant economic concern for voters. And this is presented by the Colorado College Conservation in the West Pole, which was released February of this year. Voters in three key states in the region reject diversions of river water to more populated areas, instead preferring to focus resources and energy on conservation and recycling of water. When it comes to addressing water shortage situations, more than three quarters of voters in Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming express a preference for state water officials to invest time and resources in finding ways to use the current water supply more wisely rather than diverting more water from rivers and less populated areas of the state. The rejection of diversion is strongly held across all three states and in every type of community in those states, even urban voters who are most likely to benefit preferring conservation and other means, 74 percent. Moreover, this issue stands out for having very little partisan dynamic. 74 percent of Republicans, 75 percent of Independents, and 86 percent of Democrats in these states prefer conservation. We have seen from other research in the West that voters tend to think diversions are expensive, 
harmful to wildlife and even the economies in rural areas and are perceived as more of a band-aid solution rather than a long-term fix. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy Sarver. And with Tracy is Susan and Lauren. Okay, thanks. My name is Tracy Sarver. I live on 386 Shoot Road, Golden, Colorado. I'm a professional truck driver. I've been driving since 1989. Uh, my current job, I um, haul uh, petroleum products all over the state of Colorado and New Mexico. I am the head of the safety division and driver trainer for this company. We do go down uh, Gross Dam Reservoir down the road. Um, we do not allow our tractor and trailers to get down there because it's too unsafe. Um, we only run uh, straight trucks, uh, single axle and uh, dual axle. Um, back in August, uh, Denver Water ran their test. And when I first, the, some of the citizens there in, in, the, in the canyon um, videotaped it, and I got to see that video. I did not see the Denver Water uh, video. And my conclusion was just, wow, um, very unsafe. Um, to watch it, uh, it picked up at um, the, the community hall. They had to do a three to four point turn just to get on the Gross Dam uh, Road. Um, I don't know how they're going to modify the road there to make that turn. Uh, they had to use a flagman. The time period that they did this uh, study in was uh, between 10 and 2 o'clock. Um, there's no traffic there. Everybody's at work, and no one's coming home yet. Um, they don't take into consideration coming up 72. Um, it's very uh, populated with cyclists. Even when we had the, the, the flood back in uh, October, uh, you couldn't keep the cyclists out. As soon as they fixed the road, they were there. Um, some of the turns below Carl's gas station is very, very dangerous uh, for that reason. Uh, once you made the turn on to Gross Dam, um, the first turn you come into past uh, Crescent Park, um, it takes up the whole road. You either put the, the trailer into the tree or you put the truck into the bank to make the turn. Um, that road is so heavily traveled with tourists, cyclists, um, people wanting to go boat, hikers. Um, the speed limit, like I mentioned before when we talked, is uh, 20 mile an hour, and I don't think I've ever seen a car do that yet on that road. Um, when you meet one of these trucks in the turns, you've got two options, or actually three. You're going to go over the hill, you're going to hit it, or you're going to back up. Um, the study that they took um, really was shocking um, once you leave that turn and you start down the hill, you got a couple, I think two, two or three turns that are kind of mellow, and then you come into the hairpin turn. Coming from that, from Crescent Park to that turn, you're probably looking at maybe a half a mile, not quite. Um, I noticed on the video the, the driver rode the brakes the whole way down. Um, the people that videotaped, um, this whole sequence said that they could smell the brakes already before he was even into the turn. On the video, you cannot hear the Jake brake. Jake brakes are set up in three stages. You got one, two, and three, and then the way it works, it wor a, a diesel engine is six cylinders. Stage one is two, stage two is four, and stage three is six, and that's the whole engine. Um, it was clearly, from my profession and everything, he was using stage one, which is the lowest, because Boulder County Sheriff's Department was at the turn, and they had a monitor there to be able to monitor the noise that was going to come down. That's the easiest way you can just muffle the noise. Um, any other given time, Denver water comes down through there. We live, um, it's a branch off of a gross dam road, and any given time you can hear them ripping down through there because they're using their jakes because that's what saves their brakes. So this was totally modified for that reason. Um, you, the, the video shows them going down through every turn. They are taking up the whole road. I mean the whole road. They get down to the bottom. Um, when, once you go past Walker Ranch and you go through a couple more hairpin turns, there's a turn. It's on the straightaway. And on the video, the truck going down the straightaway is taking up three-quarters of the road. If you're on a bicycle, you could probably pass him 
or he could pass you. Um, the turns, that the way that they're set up past Walker Ranch, they're called off-camera turns. And when you come into the turns, if you're going to be making a left-hand turn, it's going to kick you off to the right. And you basically got a 200-foot cliff. Um, trees aren't going to hold the truck when it rolls over. It's 80,000 pounds. Um, when they got to the bottom, I physically uh, went down in my pickup and looked at the loads that they hauled. They did not even come close to hauling the, the limit that they're going to haul. Um, they probably had a half a load, which probably put the truck at probably an empty truck weighs about 30,000 pounds. The truck there was probably about 45 to 50. They're going to be pushing 85,000 because that's the legal limit because it's a secondary road. An interstate, you can run 80,000. A secondary road like Route 72, you can run 85 legally on it. So they're going to be pushing the maximum limit going down through there, which brings me to the concern that even with him running the J-brakes and going through these turns like that, it's still going to be unsafe because of that kind of weight coming down through there. And I, the biggest thing that caught my attention was, you know, they'll sit here and they'll say, well, it's going to take five to seven years. Well, that's totally bull. It's going to take about 10 to do that. And they never tested it with a truck coming back the other way. How's another truck supposed to pass another truck in a turn? You can't. It's impossible. The way the road's set up, it's totally impossible. And when you come out of the hairpin turn from the Crescent Park one, you come to an upgrade where our road is. It's so tight, two normal-sized pickups have a hard time passing there because you have a cliff on one side and you've got sheer rocks on the other, the other side coming up. And so I think that the test that they did was totally, totally inaccurate. And um, they, need to, they need to retest it. Chris has a copy of the video I think that we made and probably of Denver Water. If you have any questions, I can sit with you personally and go over it. Um, and I also offered that I can get a tractor and trailer and um, I can take you for a ride down Gross Dam if you like. <laughs> it's not a problem. Um, and another thing, too, that I didn't even consider is the logging. If they do the logging and they pull the logs out, the trailers that they're using that they had that day are average about 70 feet. Um, that's with about a 45-foot trailer, 40 to 45-foot trailer on that. The trucks that they used, that they said that that's the company, I'm assuming, that they were going to use, they had big sleepers, so it makes the trucks longer than, the, than, than need be. When they haul logs out, you have to take into consideration they're probably going to use a 45-foot trailer, and depending on how they cut the logs, the tail swing of a, of a log hanging off the back of the trailer can go anywhere from 5 to 15 feet off the back. So when they're swinging the turns, they're taking everything out in the process. So they're going to have to clear the road considerably. And so, it, it, you know, it's just... I think that if you haven't been up there for a while, and like the one lady was saying, from from the railroad tracks down, um, if you do not hold on to your steering wheel, you'll basically do a 360 because of the washboards up there. So, and uh, it, just the biking themselves, you know, it's it's pretty extreme. I mean, uh, God bless the people who like to bike it, but it's it's there. <laughs> so, but it's it's something to consider. And like I said, I would be more than glad to go over the film with you. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. George Blakey, followed by uh, MPT Tisdale. And let's see, George, you've got, um, sorry, Lori Jansen. Okay. Um, Dan, a gentry. I, don't know, I can't read that. And Karen, you're still here. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is George Blakey. I live at 618 Aspen Meadows Road. Um, when I was growing up, um, the environmental issues were just coming into play. Um, the EPA was created, the um, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, all that was happening when I was young. The, um, as we learned, came to learn, the EIS was like the gold standard of the environmental system, and it was used to evaluate everything carefully to make sure it was done properly, to make sure every animal and plant that was going to be affected were considered, and that was to be what was 
to be followed by whoever was, had a project in mind. Um, this Moffat Tunnel Project, of course, dam expansion is the first opportunity I've had to see a EIS up close, and uh, I'm really disappointed. Um, I admit I have not read the 4,200 4, pages, which um, most people haven't, um, but I have seen a lot of um, excerpts that other people have um, written about and listened to a lot of discussion by uh, people who know a lot about what is going on in the details of the uh, statement. Um, I have a, uh, I have a part of a letter that um, a couple neighbors have put together and they've sent you a copy as well, but I thought I'd go through some of it myself because I agree with a lot of what they said. Um, it was made by um, Clark and Y. Chapman, who live on uh, Lazy Z Road, close to where we are. Um, their um, first uh, point, well, to sum summarize their letter, uh, they also didn't have time to read the 4,000 pages, um, but they submitted a very extensive uh, commentary for the draft and brown line effect statement. And so they focused on the responses to their concerns, which apparently uh, the Army Corps was required to do. And so they looked at just specifically the responses to their questions and how the Army addressed them. So um, number one, the um, FEIS contained, this is their, their words, uh, major, many major glaring errors in its maps and descriptions of locations and, and, and attributes of local roads, subdivisions, et cetera. The FEIS, is in, the FEIS is incompetently unaware of the actual geographic realities near Grosse Reservoir and thus makes absurd statements about project actions. They have things, they have maps where roads are mislabeled. They have entire subdivisions that are um, described as being on one side of the reservoir when in fact they're on the other side of the reservoir and they draw conclusions from these saying, well, we can do this and we can do that and that doesn't matter because these places are here and there, but they've got the wrong information. Um, for instance, they um, describe the um, Hawken Walker Environmental Conservation Area to be on one side of the gross reservoir when in fact it practically surrounds the reservoir. And, but they discount it being a, an issue um, because it, they're saying it's on one side and not the other. Um, the evaluation of tree removal has gone from bad in the draft environmental impact statement to worse. Even as the estimated number of trees to be cut has dramatically increased to 200,000, is their estimate, um, the FEIS now refuses to estimate how many trees will be removed or burned and the traffic impacts of logging the trucks on Highway 72, as we just heard, is a, a ridiculous uh, proposal. The, um, Magnolia Environmental Preservation Plan, which was created by neighbors of mine years ago, carefully thought out and adopted by the County of Boulder to be part of their land use um, plan, was totally ignore, ignored in the draft environmental impact statement. And um, it was mentioned once in the final, in a one sentence statement that basically says uh, the gross reservoir will have no effect on the environmental area around Magnolia Road, which is a few miles from the reservoir, and we'll have extensive logging on that side of the reservoir if indeed it takes place. There'll be lots of trucks needed, helicopters, etc. But of course they say no impact from that. There is no consideration in the FEIS of goals and purposes of the land use classification by the United States Forest Service in Boulder County of land surrounding Gross Reservoir. The FEIS simply asserts that the project does not conflict with existing land use policies, but offers no analysis of why that is true. <coughs> Next point, the FEIS is clueless about the numbers of people in the affected neighborhoods and where they live. It adopts a gerrymandered primary impact area, which I've seen a map of this. It's the, it shows us not a circle, but an area around Gross Reservoir that's supposed to be the areas that are most affected. Well, it's totally off center. It's not even a circle. Gross Reservoir is down to one edge of it. It almost completely ignores um, everything to one to the other side of um, Highway 72, which is Gilpin County and the others. Um, uh, he's, uh, the Chapman's uh, right. It adopts a gerrymandered 
um, area for socioeconomic analysis not centered on the reservoir that includes unaffected national forest lands up to four and a half miles away, but excludes heavily populated subdivisions as close as a half mile to the reservoir. The FEI, the F FEIS asserts that since the Corps will not make substantial changes to the proposed action that are relevant to environmental concerns and there are no s significant new circumstances or information relevant to the environmental concerns and bearing on the proposed action or its impact, a supplemental document will not be prepared for the Moffitt project. Someone else has already brought this up. This is an astonishing statement that evidently says that all the public commentary on the DEIS provided no new information bearing on the project or its impacts. This is a shocking rebuke to all of the members of the public and officials who supplied abundant information that was surely new to the Corps and the URS. And number eight, the Corps response to us that the project is compatible with a FERC license, Article 414, which covers visual resource protection, is a lie. The actual text of the FEIS Chapter 5, Oops. says just the opposite. It says why degradation of visual resources cannot be mitigated in the short term and only partially in the long term. Their conclusion reads as follows. Incompetence and obsolescence pervade the FEIS, which is difficult to understand since the Corps and the URS had four years to revise and update the faulty DEIS. It violates the NEPA in failing to provide substantive, substantive response or consideration to important critiques we and many others submitted if the sloppy, erroneous, and unprofessional character of parts of the FEIS that we had time to study are typical of the rest of the 10,000-page document, then it should summarily be rejected by the EPA and the Army Corps. The FEIS wholly fails to justify the need for the project, fails to honestly outline the impacts, and withholds descriptions of vital major parts of the project that should be explained in an EIS for public comment and before permitting. In its failure to assess reasonable conservation intensive alternatives to the adopted alternative and in its failure to objectively assess the negative impacts of the project on surrounding communities and environment, the FEIS violates the requirements or an EIS as specified in the NEPA. So my questions to you, which I, are rhetorical in nature, is if Boulder County had requested their staff to create this report and it took four years and the result was a document that was totally flawed and missing many important information, would you consider that acceptable? Would Boulder County approve any industrial activity on the scale of this if the gross dam was not there, if it was just a new project to be created in Boulder County in the, in the same area, what would the Boulder County's um, approach to that be? And after reviewing all of this, would this document be considered unprofessional or one-sided? Thanks, that's all I have. Thank you. MP Tisdale? followed by Amy, or I'm sorry, Abby Burke. Hi, my name's Peter Teasdale. I live at 1815 Gross Dam Road. Um, I don't write very well, so most of what I'm gonna tell you is, it's quoted from other documentation. Um, we'll start with Arvada. 2012 adopted budget. The 2012 adopted budget, quote, as you are well aware, we are committed to the financial support of the completion of the Denver Water Board's Northern Supply Expansion System. The project provides a once in a generation opportunity, ensuring that there will be sufficient available for the uh, sufficient water available for the ultimate build out of the city by mid century. There will also be a significant financial obligation in the future for our water, water fund, an obligation of $84 million, of which they already had in 2012, 51,300,000 in reserve, already for that project. Um, 
At the same time in Nevada, in the same budget, their expenditures for water supply operations and conservation, the conservation bit, I'm here hitting here. In 2009, they put a million and 300,000 for that. In 2011, it was down to 750,000. 2012, their budget was 690,000. Their conservation budget was cut by half in those, those years. Um, so Avada, um, basically part of their uh, remit was they got a, a Brian Lewandowski, MBA Leeds School of Business, University of Colorado Boulder. In 2007, he produced a report uh, basically looking at the Avada, Colorado, Vaux, Cimarron Park, Candelis, basically, uh, just to sort of see what they're going to get out of it. Their report said that on average, um, there was 398 single family permits and 166 multifamily permits annually, with a peak in 2004 of 1,058 permits on Avada's books. So the peak in, in 2004 was 1,058 permits, building permits, residential building permits. In 2012, when I downloaded the information, there were 10,664 <coughs> residential building permits. So if you compare that with the 2005 household count, in 2005 there were 41,370 households, and in 2012 they're adding another 10,500 residential properties. So they're certainly building out that northwest quadrant. How are they doing that? Um, the Avada Urban Renewal Authority um, produced a publication, or rather they had a publication produced for them, called the Northwest Avada Urban Renewal Plan. This was published in 2009, and it was written by URS. They did a blight study. They decided that the corridor north of 72 between 93 and Indiana, stuff that you guys have been saving all around Boulder because it looks good, they decided that was blight. Quote, slum deterioration or deteriorated structures, defective or inadequate street layout, unsafe unsanitary conditions, deterioration of site and other improvements, unusual topo topography or inadequate public improvements. And I thought maybe they meant all that semi-industrial stuff and that huge, enormous tower that's south of um, 72, between 93 and Indiana. But when you look at the map, hmm, that stuff's missing. That's not included in the blight study. What else have we got? Um, let's head south of Denver. South of Denver, there is uh, the WISE project. Uh, water infrastructure and supply efficiency. Um, Denver Water, in collaboration with Aurora, are providing 14 uh, metropolitan districts south of Denver with water. And to quote, this in a publication 2011 called Solutions, it says, in addition to its benefits of Denver Water and the West Slope, the proposed agreement will trigger a major water sharing and conservation arrangement between Denver Water, Aurora Water, and water providers in the South Denver metro area. So they're calling selling water to those metropolitan areas as a conservation arrangement. Um, in the same document on page 13, it says the water that Denver will put into WISE is primarily reusable return flows from its Blue River systems. No new diversions will be needed in Denver's mountain system to provide wise water. So let's remember that bit. In this documentation, they're saying that no new diversions will be needed in Denver's mountain from the mountain systems. So Accelerate Colorado obviously didn't realize that. Accelerate Colorado is a combination of metropolitan and businesses that decided to go to DC on 2012 and in their 109-page document, um, they asked, I guess, Congress to support the WISE project. Um, to quote from that document, it says, um, two projects that are essential to the future needs of the metro area to move forward, the WISE project 
and Denver Water's Moffitt project before Denver Water and Aurora Water can begin to sell unused water to the 14 entities that make up the South Metro Water Supply Authority, Denver Water, Denver water must expand the Moffitt collection system, which includes the expansion of the existing gross reservoir in order to give Denver Water's collection water network greater balance and increased supply. The WISE project would allow Denver Water and Aurora Water to sell water to the South Metro Water Supply Authority during wet years in which there is water uh, surplus. And when you look at their information, they're quoting in their agreement that they're going to authorize a minimum of 100,000 acre feet over a 10 year block an average of 10,000 acre feet per year, but no more than, oh, only 25,000 acre feet per one single year to metropolitan districts south of Denver through the WISE project, and that can only take place if Gross Dam Reservoir is expanded. So I guess ex uh, Accelerate Colorado, I guess, didn't know about that. Let's have a look at Parker Water and Sanitation District, one of the 14 uh, authorities. Um, they've got Router Hess. They, they increased Router Hess from 16,200 acre feet to 72,000 acre feet, an increase of 50,000 acre feet. Um, a year and a half later, um, 13th of February 2014, it was only 10% full, <coughs> a year and a half after it was actually built. They're in the process of um, communicating with the Corps of Engineers to try and get the permit changed for Outer Hess so it can accept wise water. They're going through that process at the moment. But let's go back to conservation. Um, water conservation is certainly an issue, and there's been a number of studies. California's done a really good job looking at um, water conservation. They've employed some folks to do some studies. And you've heard gallons per person or capita per day. They're using information that's gallons per household per day. And they were wanting to try and reduce their impact from 175 gallons per household per day down to 105 and 120 gallons per household per day. And that's pretty good. They, they, they did comparisons to Australia. And in Australia, they were saying that their daily indoor use was 67 gallons per capita per day. And they could get down to that mainly through three ways. And one way was to decrease outside um, watering. And so 50%, you look at all the information, they say 50% of water that goes to Denver and the residents, it goes onto lawns, it goes into the outside. Basically, in the time that California reduced their, uh, their water consumption by 10%, Australia, Australia reduced theirs by 37% by, by adopting this, these techniques. Um, they didn't have to go very far to get the person who wrote this study. It was William B. Diorio. He lives in Boulder. He has a, he's president of Aquacraft. He's produced documents, and he's actually done a research paper for Denver Water. None of this I can find in the references for the EIS. None of these conservation, these conservation measures um, are in the references. I did a quick search in there. And so there's obviously a lot of information which Denver Water is deciding not to include. Um, William, he lives just on Pine Street. But, or rather, his business is on Pine Street. If you don't know about him or... Uh, I think he's certainly someone who could be contacted because he did a, a study in 2006 and he found that the daily capita use went down from 67 gallons per, cube, per person per day in 1996 down to, into six, 65 in 2005. They deemed that not st statistically significant reduction despite their conservation measures. Thank you. And um, we have Abby Burke, and Abby, you have 10 minutes, just checking. We've got Ron, and Anthony, Lynn. Thank you, commissioners, for hosting this additional meeting. My name is Abby Burke. I live at 386 Chute Road. I'm a Coal Creek Canyon resident, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of National Audubon. I'm their Western Rivers Action Network coordinator 
work with approximately 10,000 people across Colorado on river conservation, water conservation, and water policy issues. Audubon is mostly engaged within the riparian habitat impacts um, within this proposed project. Riparian areas and rivers make up less than 5% of our total land area, but they are the most complex and important habitat we have. Over 90% of Colorado bird species critically rely on riparian zones for part of their annual life cycle. 51% of all breeding avian species in the southwest United States are completely dependent upon riparian vegetation. Most Colorado rivers have no prescribed minimum flows, and a healthy riparian zone needs more than that. Riparian habitats are fragile. Variable river flows that include high and occasional flooding flows support riparian vegetation. Recent studies have shown that diverting more than 20% of a stream's native flow can cause damage, and many streams in Colorado have far more water than that removed. Most water used will eventually return to the stream from which it was taken, even if many miles downstream. Water taken out of its original basin for use in another basin is gone forever. Currently, the Fraser River has 60% of its average annual native flow diverted, with an additional 15 to 20% proposed through the Moffat Expansion Project. Less water in a stream changes the stream, impacting macroinvertebrates, fish, and wildlife habitats. Contaminants are more concentrated, the stream is slower and warmer, and sediments accumulate as the flow slows. Riparian habitats are significantly impaired below diversion structures. The following comments I'm going to present on behalf of Audubon are accordance to the Appendix M called conceptual mitigation. First, focusing on riparian habitats impacts mitigation. Audubon believes there needs to be expanded consideration for riparian habitat mitigation and revegetation. An example, the gross reservoir native riparian habitat impacts are noted to be four acres, and the revegetation post-construction will be four acres. This is inadequate as currently proposed. Mitigation should result in a net increase. A greater ratio of vegetation will allow assurance for long-term native riparian habitat survival. In addition, given the impacts expected with this project, a clear description of mitigation should be included in the project documents. Such language includes and I quote, the sequence of mitigation actions will be as described below in three steps. One, avoid. Adverse impacts to resources are to be avoided and no action shall be permitted if there is a practicable alternative with less adverse impacts. Two, minimize. If impacts to resources cannot be avoided, appropriate and practicable steps to minimize adverse impacts must be taken. Three, compensate. Appropriate and practicable compensatory mitigation is required for unavoidable adverse impacts that remain. The amount and quality of compensatory mitigation may not substitute for avoiding minimizing impacts. Finally, Audubon believes that impacts on West Slope riparian vegetation should be recognized. The FEIS suggests that impacts on West Slope riparian vegetation are negligible. Riparian vegetation is sustained by natural seasonal hydrograph flows. Reducing flows by increasing diversion of native flows will have a negative impact on riparian vegetation. These negative impacts must be appropriately mitigated for. Second larger point of contention, the cumulative impacts. Both proposed projects of Windy Gap Firming Project and the Moffat Expansion Project will be drawing out of the upper Colorado River Basin. The record of decision for Windy Gap Firming Project will come out in 2014. Moffat is upstream of Windy Gap, and the combination of both expanded diversion projects on the Upper Colorado Basin would be significant. If both projects were to be operational, then a far greater detail is needed to account for the cumulative impacts. Third point of focus, avian species. Of specific interest to Audubon are avian species, especially those noted as special status species. In the FEIS, it is noted Activities at Gross Reservoir may affect local populations of northern goshawk, flemulated owl, American three-toed woodpecker, and olive-sided flycatcher, but it is unlikely to affect regional populations. Other sensitive animal species, including bald eagle, American peregrine falcon, black swift, dwarf shrew, fringed myotis, Townsend's big-eared bat, and northern leopard frog are, likely to be, are unlikely to be affected. Audubon is concerned that the FEIS minimizes the impacts on these special status species. 
On a daily basis, habitat and ecosystems are compromised or lost to various forms of development and related encroachment. While Audubon recognizes the need to increase the reliability of water supply, Audubon remains concerned about the impacts of this development on avian species and their related habitat. In closing, commissioners, Colorado rivers and riparian zones are essential in supporting our natural landscape, wildlife communities, agriculture, industry, recreation, and outdoor lifestyles. Environmental flow science, the science that studies flow requirements for healthy rivers, is still very young. We do not have flow data substantiating what healthy rivers require in order to provide their vast functions and benefits to humans, wildlife, and riparian ecosystems. We don't know what we don't know and should err on the side of extreme caution. Once healthy rivers and riparian areas are gone, they are difficult, if ever possible, to get back. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of our um, pooled sign-up list. But we do have a few more individuals that were signed up. So Bill Merline, or Merlin, followed by um, Todd Edelman. Hi, um, <clears throat> my name is Bill Merline. <clears throat> I live at 86 Spruce Way in Mid Gilpin County. Um, I just have a few points here. Uh, there may be incentives for you to look for modifications or mitigation here, but I urge you to do whatever you can to simply stop this project. I can't find any value in it for Boulder County. That is, don't try hard uh, to look for a way to do it by mitigations and so forth, but look hard to find a, a way to stop it. Um, the American Forestry Association estimates the value of a tree for erosion control, shading, wildlife shelter, air pollution control alone over 50 years to be $57,000. Multiply that by 200,000 trees, and that is over $11 billion. That's with a B, uh, or a cost of about $230 million per year in trees alone to Boulder County and its residents. Uh, that's without the value of trees for recreation, aesthetics, or CO2 scrubbing and that alone dwarfs any value to Denver water. Um, as far as the EIS uh, need statement, uh, they clearly stated in there that their models are based on unrestricted water use. I find that completely absurd. Uh, why am I, as a Gilpin County rural resident, forbidden from using even an ounce of water from my private well for outside purposes? I can't, water, I can't put water in a dog's bowl um, or water a small flower pot, yet Denver residents can do unrestricted lawn watering uh, and golf courses, businesses, industry, and mining have no limits. This plan steals water from residents like me while supporting unlimited growth and unlimited water use in Denver. And then as far as the EIS alone is concerned, uh, the outcome of that is no surprise. I've seen many of these over the years. Uh, that are very heavy, they have 16,000 pages, they look like someone really put a lot of work into it, they have charts, graphs, maps, uh, and all kinds of detail on each individual river, subregion, uh, different trees and plant species, animal species, and counts of all of those per acre uh, to three different decimal places. Uh, they look really precise and looks like somebody put a lot of work into it. They're very heavy, so someone must have done a lot of work. I've seen this before. For example, the Gilpin County Commissioners requested a community wildfire study. Uh, they got it, and, and when it came back, they asked for public comment on it. Uh, and when we asked for uh, such things as what would happen if we were to actually do the mitigation they suggested, uh, there was no response. Uh, they did not change the report. Uh, it came back, and the Gilpin County Commissioners accepted it as it was because they were just happy to have any kind of report at all. Um, they also did a similar thing when they were considering a, a gravel quarry in the county. Uh, the company proposed something that uh, reported no Im impacts on the 24-7 rock hauling dust, light pollution, noise pollution, and so forth. Uh, and anyone alive would have realized that, that was, they were just lying. Uh, luckily, the commissioners rejected it. Um, so the problem is um, simply that, uh, just 10 seconds, uh, that e often these are controlled by special interests or the, the problem is so complex because all of these different systems are interacting that it's hard to actually predict what's going to happen. Either the results are unknown or unknowable. Thank you. Thank you. Todd Edelman. And if we've lost Todd, then Carolyn Brzezinski. Sorry, I always get your name wrong on the last part. But Thank you. 
my name is Carolyn Beninsky. I'm here uh, on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center. And we're new to this issue. Uh, I just want to first thank the county commissioners for your strong letter against this, um, this uh, final environmental impact statement. And kudos to Teg and to all the young people who have been working on this for so long and the old people. But yeah. I particularly note, and I'm very <laughs> impressed by the younger people here today, uh, there's a uh, a commercial, an ad that I used to watch on Free Speech TV where there was this train coming down a track and there was a man walking down the track and he said, uh, they say the climate's changing, I don't care, I'm not going to be here. You know, he was in his 50s. And so then he walks off the track and there's this little girl about four years old walking down the track. and. You know, uh, yeah, it's kind of scary. I mean, I feel a little scared today. I don't know if anyone else does. But I just wanted to say a couple of things. We did send you um, what we had submitted to the, um, uh, to, to the Army Corps. Uh, and um, so I'm not going to, people have said so much, and everything I was going to say has already been said. But I, I did want to just say a couple of things is, you know, I think this, this, um, company URS that's very significant uh, their role in in uh, doing this document when there's clearly a conflict of interest and clearly there's a lot of problems with that company so in my mind what it really says is the Army Corps did not do its job it, it handed over this this uh, very important process to um, to Denver Water and their designated uh, person to do this, and it, it really is so faulty that you really can't even, uh, you know, take it seriously. I don't think. Um, I, I want to just say, and this was mentioned by uh, Allison Burke, Abby Burke. You know, this issue of uh, the other species, and you know, we get very uh, sentimental about about these species, but they have a right to be here too. And I know there's been some controversy, but the bears and the mountain lions and the, um, and the birds, none of them can live without water. I mean, we're 70% we're water ourselves. They can't live without water. So just to get to the, I see the yellow light, conservation is really the issue. We really don't need this Kentucky bluegrass in Colorado. We don't need to spend half of our, our residential water on uh, a, a really an invasive species. I mean, isn't Kentucky bluegrass does not belong in the semi-arid area of Colorado. And we need to start to uh, change our minds about, uh, about grass and about what we really need to use water for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Emily Torsi, followed by David Little. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, my name is Emily Cherisi at 525 22nd Street, uh, Boulder, Colorado, 80302. I'm reading comments tonight on behalf of Susan Bates at 11917 Coal Creek Heights Drive, Golden, Colorado. Um, she was unable to be here tonight. Her letter reads, County Commissioners, I first want to thank you for scheduling this hearing even though the deadline for comment on the FEIS has passed. and shows your dedication to the public and we greatly appreciate that. I am a climate scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the Climate Change Research section, section of the Climate and Global Dynamics Division. I have read the relevant parts of the FEIS for climate change and feel that the document does not address climate change issues sufficiently. Climate change is expected to reduce the amount of water available in rivers and thus available for storage in reservoirs. The recent National Climate Assessment chapter on water resources project reductions in runoff for the Colorado River on the order to 10 to 30 percent by the year 2050. I'd also like to point out that the current estimates of river flow for the Colorado River were made using river gauge data from the 20th century. However, studies have shown that the 20th century in relation to previous centuries was relatively wet, and therefore these estimates are likely an overestimation of average river flow. A study published in Nature Climate Change investigates projections of surface water availability for the southwest United States with a particular focus on the region encompassing the headwaters of the Colorado River. This study projects reduced soil moisture and runoff leading to a decline in Colorado River flow. 
This, the reduction is mainly driven by an increase in evaporation that despite a potential increase in precipitation will reduce soil moisture in runoff. By increasing gross reservoir from 418 to 818 square feet of surface area, water loss from, reservoir, from the reservoir will significantly increase due to evaporation, making the use of reservoirs to maintain water supply less efficient in the future. None of these projections were taken into consideration within the FEIS, and I don't see how, when using these estimates, that Denver Water can expect to pull even more water from the Colorado River in the future. The FEIS states in the executive summary that there is currently no accepted scientific method for taking the general concepts associated with climate change and transforming them into incremental changes in stream flow or reservoir levels. However, there have been numerous studies that use stream flow or land surface models to project stream flow, reservoir levels, and water deliveries in the future. The result of one such study from the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which uses the Colorado River budget model, estimates that the likelihood of reservoirs relying on the Colorado River being 80% full will decline drastically in the near future, with there only being a 10% chance of 80% capacity by the year 2030. I don't have time to go through all of the examples of such models and their results, but the point is that the impact of climate change can be assessed now. The FEIS has claimed that either data or methods to make projections of future river flow are not available, but as I've shown, this is not the case. Many such studies have already been conducted and many probabilistic and modeling methods are currently available that could be used to project the availability of water. Thank you. Thank you. David Little. And then let me just check, is anybody else who hasn't spoken or ceded their time to someone else Still wanting to speak. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Dave Little. I'm the director of planning for Denver Water. First of all, I'd like to thank the commissioners for having this meeting. Uh, we have something in common. We too requested that the Corps extend the comment period because we felt that it was important for um, the Corps to hear all the issues associated with this project. We recognize it's a large project. It's in the local community that we're partners in that community. Uh, so we're very interested in making sure that the commissioners here and the core hears all the issues. And the passion that the people here in the audience have shown and some of the information that they've brought forward is important for you to consider in augmenting your comments to the core. And uh, the, the, the community also needs to send their comments directly to the core. So we don't want to take up any more of your time tonight, but that's what we would like to say. And thank you very much for having the opportunity for the community to comment. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Greg Ching, 18 Meadowland Court. I wasn't actually planning to speak tonight, but hearing the very eloquent and detailed explanations tonight remind me like, the first time I came to this room. Uh, that was about six, eight years ago. And it was because Boulder County didn't like the fact that I was doing house concerts. Uh, these were events 12 times a year, and we had a go through two years before we could actually get that approved. And I want to thank you for making that happen to Cindy. But um, it occurred to me that 35 years ago, I was a student at Stanford University, and I was holding a sign saying, you know, please close, uh, please save Emily, please close Rocky Flats. I had never, ever been to Colorado, but it was important to me. I kind of feel at this point in time that with this notion of, of environment, fracking, water usage, and things like that, there is a connection here. It's not been stated, and I remember uh, asking, you know, in the previous time we were here, whether Denver Water would be willing to put in a clause in their agreements so that none of the water would be used for fracking. And at that time, I remember even asking David when he came to my house last year, you know, uh, which is very gracious of him to do so. Um, you know, I asked that question, and, you know, I don't think he was able to say, yes, they would do it. But that was something that was important to me. The other aspect was that uh, I actually had spoken to then Mayor Hickenlooper uh, several years ago, and I was asking him about Gross Dam at that point. I said, wouldn't it be much, um, and I misunderstood the relationship between the city of Denver and Denver Water, because I thought he appointed the Board of Trustees and he ran it that way, like the city department. He said no, but he did appoint the people. I said, wouldn't it be a lot less expensive to actually just replace toilets because at my house, I use one pint flush toilets. I've been doing that for the last 10 years. They work fine. And, you know, inefficient toilets are seven and a half gallons. Maybe the low flush toilets are two and a half gallons, that sort of thing. Wouldn't be a lot faster in doing it that way. And he said at that time that the, in order to meet their downstream commitments, you know, they needed to start recirculate the water. That to me seemed kind of specious because it still meant wasting the energy and water and that sort of thing. Well, the other part of it is that um, I've 
since the house concert thing, I actually went ahead and put a water meter. I've been very comfortable using five to 10 gallons of water a day in my home for the last 10 years. And I just think it's really possible to do that and not have a poor quality of life. Um, if there is a, an effort here, I'm pretty certain we can try putting a hands around gross dam or something like that, like we did around Rocky Flats. Thank you. <laughs> Greg, could Thank you. you. Greg, could you sign this sheet right there on the other table? Thank you. Great. Let me check just one last time if there's anybody else who hasn't spoken or seated their time. Okay, great. Well, we want to thank you so much for your um, very um, articulate comments and your thoughtfulness in bringing all the, this information to us. We will be looking at the various themes that were carried out in the comments and putting them into our further response to the um, final EIS. Let me just check to see if my colleagues have any comments they'd like to add. Well, I'm just wondering if it would be useful to sort of highlight for staff what we know some of those themes are or <laughs> highlight for Michelle. For Michelle, who is? OK, go. Um, so I'll just start throwing stuff out and chime in. Um, I, I think we whole, heard uh, multiple times about the absence of um, climate change analysis um, in the FEIS and how that might impact everything from, well, certainly West Slope impacts, which are important for the core to consider. but. It, not, not exactly in Boulder County, but nonetheless, um, the timing and the ability for um, an expanded gross reservoir to fill. And then also um, the larger impacts on Colorado River um, flows and, and um, legal requirements around that. Um, there was uh, numerous um, data issues raised um, that might be worth flagging everything from the use of median versus average um, in the statistics, um, whether or not the cost um, estimates are updated and accurate. Um, there were numerous other examples, but that seemed to be a, um, a theme. Uh, somebody mentioned mismap, uh, mislabeled um, maps and whether or not the primary impact area was um, properly designated. Um, the integrity of the EIS process and the selection of URS was flagged numerous times. It might be worthy of just um, noting that that was an issue of concern raised given how, how prevalent it was. Um, our comments flag issues around passenger safety, but we heard some detailed um, comments about um, the actual feasibility of truck movement on the roads, and that might be used, useful to put a little bit more um, detail around that. Do other folks want to throw in any? Let me check my list and see if I missed any. Well, one thing, thanks everybody for taking the time to come in here. And, you know, I think that it was very interesting. I appreciated all the technical information that we got this time, seemed to be even more so than last time. And um, the, uh, I don't know if I understood it all, but I took good notes and <laughs> the, uh, and I presume that you sent it in and that um, I guess we don't have perfect information. We don't know how it will be re received, but we'll just do our best. Um, it seemed like a lot of people talked. Did you mention this one purpose and need that they really didn't? Um, you know, many people highlighted the fact that the initial reason for this project needs to be outlined in their purpose and need, and it doesn't seem like they did. That. And we There's mentioned that in our comments, but we don't we specifically point out sort of how nearly it's construed and that right. construction right. seemingly precluded a, 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 the breadth of analysis of the different viable alternatives. Right. So that's a good one to flag. Um, and there were a lot, of, several comments about um, riparian corridors and um, wetland habitat and the impact on those. And just the interrelatedness that came up several times in several speakers' yes. comments that the, those connections are not thoroughly examined in the EIS. And I think it's worth noting, uh, I think there were riparian impacts that were noted on both sides of the divide. And even though Boulder County's comments focused on Boulder County, I think it's useful flagging. There's a lot of um, technical data brought up about 
um, those impacts outside the, the county and that we would want to draw the core's attention to those substantive comments even though they're outside Boulder County. You know, the wetlands. Really the Fraser River and right. yeah. yeah, wetlands there. And um, I know that we got um, at least one um, email comment. This one was from um, Judith Green about things that they did not include in um, their statements from um, the environmental group to the core. So now that, I, this is a process question, I guess then. So that's a comment that we received. And so we should be able to include that as, I mean, it's a written comment versus an oral comment. So we should be able to include that um, in, as another comment. Any of the things we got via email that we consider to be substantive. Sure, yeah. substantive comment doesn't have to come orally. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I wonder if there are further substantive components that certainly are from Lisa's PowerPoint and Jeff's PowerPoint. That you yeah. may have already sent them in, but there may be some way that we should include them in our response as well. So I'm sure there are other ones, but that's just off the top of the head from the chicken scratch during the hearing. But we'll circle back and make sure we didn't miss anything important. Yeah. Because I'm sure people are sitting in the audience going, but wait, I wait, mentioned I one more thing. Right? So. Yeah. Commissioners, I've been trying to take notes. I will send these to you, and then you can look at those okay. and hopefully add. Okay. And I, too, wanted to thank everybody for taking up quite a good portion of your evening to be here and to provide public input. It's very important. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>